Yeah. Hello everyone, let's see, let's hope this is working now. God, I look like I'm in some sort of horror movie reject right now, so let me deal with that one. Um, oh, let's try that. Um, maybe it will look better that way. Ugh, good old night. Oof. That makes me look more human. I'll probably have to adjust it as we go on, but yes, that was me done. I'm sorry, XSplit decided I wasn't me again uh, for the fourth time this week. I have needed to reload, re-engage it, and basically tell it what I wanted to do again. It's always fun, XSplit. It really is fun. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Ay, <sighs> caramba. I need iron brew for this. And I will reorientate the microphone so it's closer to me and you can hear me, hopefully. And, yep. Yeah, helmet hair does go through various things when you're hanging around Dragon NFL. Uh, wait until you see him with torpedo juice hair. Hello, Jess P. Hello, Jamie Peter. Hello, Jess P. I'm sure, that was more earlier. Um, hello, Rick Vasava. Tom Golding. Um, I don't think it's loaded all the earlier ch messages because there are a lot of earlier messages on here. I know that because I said some. So it's managed to knock out a whole load. Hang on, it might have got them. Um, hello to Anne, Eric, and Louise. Thank you very much for my presence. And thank you very much to my mom and my sister for their presence as well. It was very nice. Um, you can see one of my cards. The rest of the cards are all in the traditional place in the, in the lounge, but that one, this one's in my office. Keep me company. Right then, let's see. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Rick Basala. Hello, Jane and Tom Golding. Hello, Nautical Wolf. Howdy, everyone. Hope you're all well. Yes, I hope you're well too. Hello, Nanook. Hello, Dan Freeman. Thank you for being online tonight. It's always good to have an admin there. A role, which I have to admit. Surprising enough, those closest to me do not want to take up. I keep suggesting when I didn't like it, but they all go, no. No, none of my family or loved ones would like to take up the role of being an admin on my chat. I, I don't know why. They all tell me to watch the whole thing. Oh. No, that will knock that off. Oh, yeah. But that will be sensible. So, oh, what if I knocked over? Oh, a screwdriver. Don't worry, that's the electric screwdriver. That's fine. It's as tough as nails. Uh, hello, Paul Johnson. Hello, Stafford Thompson. Hello, how are you doing? Um, hello, Grusowski. There are the best of some messages for me. Hello, Keydron. <laughs> Have you all, for starters, there are three things which I keep reminding people to do. One, is put in their suggestions for names for the office. Two, please vote in the patron cider sort of question of the topics uh, if you're a patron. And three, if you do like the videos, please like. If you feel like watching more, please subscribe. Maybe press the little bell down there. And if you feel like donating to my book habit, and possibly my office habit, which it seems to be expanding, um, please pay, consider patron. But if you just feel like joining the conversation, there's always Discord. Links to it are both down below. 
There you go. That's out of the way and done. Hello. Ooh, there's an interesting conversation going on here. Hello, King's Rook. I envy your ability to cook. I haven't had the mental capacity for anything more difficult than putting something in the microwave for years now. Mm. Just P, my husband doesn't believe in expiration dates, so we have interesting flora in the refrigerator sometimes. I have to say, um, the interesting person with their versions on expiration dates in my family is probably my sister. I love her dearly, but there are... I am very, very lucky I have realized that my girlfriend has a similar policy to me, in that, um, no. <laughs> Grazazi, try singing to it. That worked last time. I was trying to try it this time. Um, I was wondering how things were going, Bridget House. I suspect that, like the British Army, it takes some earlier reverses before he gets up to speed and starts winning. Not quite. It's more a case of X Split keeps deciding to log me out, lock me out, and I think it's probably because I haven't yet paid for it. And I should do, and I will do. But their free version does okay, and frankly, that's annoying enough. I'm if I start paying for it, I'm going to actually expect it to be decent. Can I answer? Uh, and another, a dishwashing machine. A dishwashing machine is a must for a family piece for a married man. Eh, washing up's okay. Crazy locker. I have to admit, I spent ten hours yesterday doing a top to bottom refrigerator cleaning. Bridge itself decided to grow furry due to uh, something my cat's knocked into the bottom door seal. Yes, Yowza. Right. Uh, da, 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 da. Anyone I'm missing? Hello, Enterprise. Just spotted you popped in there. And hello, Dirt Squad. And hello, everyone. So, we've got a busy week coming up ahead of us, and I say this as a person who's going to be very, very busy. Hello, Carter. Um, I, of course, have a long patrol coming out on Tuesday, which is always fun. But um, more than that, this week, on Friday, it's Armchair Admirals, and we have Jamie joining... The discussion on Matapan is going to be fun. We also are recording, we have uh, um, a lovely, a very, very cool um, bilge pumps coming out this week. Something I'm looking forward to when it comes out. So really, it's going to be a fun week. Busy, but fun. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jamie, Peter, if it's an open vote, isn't the office going to end up called the Blackburn Black Man? You see, this is where my experience in local politics comes in. Anyone can submit a shed name, but I am not going to repeat the Boaty McBoaty face <coughs> saga. No, 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 not with my office. So what I've said is just like with the patron votes, I'm going to look at more and I'm going to decide probably chatting with Drac, which are the ones I can make into the coolest sign and live with on my office. Uh, in which case, they will then be put up to a vote, and it'll be whichever one that's voted wins. But it'll be one I can live with. So probably not Blackburn, Blackburn. Mainly because I'm a naval historian. Naming it even after a naval aviation aircraft just seems wrong. Mm. 
And thank you to everyone for your very kind birthday wishes. It was very kind of you. Hello, Lawrence Cook, and hello, Michael Patton. Hey, remember, it's nice to see you learn about internet naming conventions and the all important veto. Yeah. Anyone can suggest a name. That is welcome. All names are welcome, suggested on Patreon. They are all names that are welcome. But um, not all names will be selected. Mm hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Right, so today's topics is, of course, Brew Ships 42. And there's going to be a few, well, one different thing in here. I'm going to try and get, put some pictures of the books up if I can find the pictures of the books that I want. So that's why I'm currently... <laughs> it's the picture which I've got for the... Um... First book is the one which has turned out the most terrible when I did a quick run through before it decided to lock me out. <sighs> Helpful. Us. It could be a lot worse. So, how are we all doing today? How's everything going? How our weeks been? You know, as said, I've had a birthday this week, which is always interesting. As most of my family would tell you, I am not the best birthday person. I spend a whole year trying to avoid my birthday, mainly because it always leads to so many debates and discussions. Bilge Pumps 38 is still the latest Simsec has up. Well, I'm going to be sending them an email shortly with Bilge Pumps 42. So hopefully that will catch up with them. Hello, Petminter. And sorry about the circle of death, then. <clears throat> Apparently, when I'm downloading an image, it doesn't like it. We'll see if it works. Hi, Gareth Ramlowski. And thank you, Dan Freeman. <sighs> yeah. My office. I have to admit, my poor girlfriend really tries hard every year, and so far she's had two years where we just haven't been able to see each other because of the distance involved. And there is no one more birthday orientated than my girlfriend. I mean, literally, her birthday breakfasts are legendary. So, this is the first book today, and it's a bit of a new one to me, because... I had been looking for a book to talk about which was new to me entirely because I thought we're going to be doing some continuation some series I've already mentioned some new ones and I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite authors who's who actually has died but the series of books he published he he has written are still coming out because he'd already completed the series they just hadn't all been published and frankly he's he's what i would consider almost a terry pratchett-esque um author in that he does make it quite funny and i like that i like books which make me laugh i like books which make me think those are my criteria when i want a book to relax and read to i like a book which make, makes me think sort of hmm, look at things crooked and i like a book which makes me laugh this is why probably i like this this series as well 
Because it does have a lot in it to make you laugh. It really does. Now, By the way, if anyone wants to know why we had the circle of death early, I just figured it out. Despite having the hardwire cable plugged in and everything plugged in, it was, the computer was still trying to work through the Wi-Fi. <sighs> I think anyone will notice if I decided to go for a swim in a, in a tub of iron brew? <laughs> <clears throat> Ouch. And sometimes the dog like, if it's any closer to the edge of a glass sheet, took a little slice out of my right middle knuckle on her side. Couldn't get a stitch, to, uh, stitch where it is, and you can and keep it clean. Ouch. Don't do that to yourself. You know, th 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 this is why people like me exist in the world. People who don't feel pain anymore. We hurt ourselves too often, but you know, it's not a good idea to do so. Glenn Stewart is pretty good. I have to say, I sort of started backwards with him because the first of his books I got were The Peacekeepers of Soul. And if I can just track down this book, the book, and we have that, and that, there we go. Mm hmm. Hmm. I then. Did it did it did it open up the Kindle? And open up. You see, this is how organized I am on my Kindle. I'm not sure if it will show it to you. But I actually have made a um no I won't show it but it's basically i've managed to make a a, a whole sort of that showing sort of ah yeah there you go i've got the whole collection of books organized up together nicely just to make sort of get things right and each of the books is at the right point in them Hmm, it's fun. Yeah, the new Peacekeepers of Soul comes in on the in June. Mm-hmm. Now, let's see if I can find the section I'm looking for. <laughs> I've rigged the main position cap uh, the main positron capacitors, Wong told Carl. Uploading the command sequence to your datapad. Blow them, and Avalon turns into a giant shotgun blast in the sky. The engineer paused. I'd wait as late as possible to use it, though, he pointed out. Hell, I'd, I'd send a computer to do this, boss. There's a reason we don't run starfighters with just computers. Alistair, Carl reminded him. Too predictable. I doubt they've got too much le uh, got much left in terms of onboard control weapons, but if I'm doing this, I want to carry it all the way. Wong sighed. 
Yeah, I figured whatever stunt you'd pull wouldn't involve us running away, he continued dryly. So I moved all the, the remaining electromagnetic deflectors. Hmm. All those the, the, the electro remaining electromagnetic deflectors to the front of the ship. They'll have a hell of a time hitting you with lances, and you've got some anti-missile lasers. We've set them to automatic, but they should stop at least a few birds. Thank you, Commander, Carl said. Now, I believe you have a shuttle? The term to die alone, huh? Duty is heavier than a mountain. Death is lighter than a feather, Carl quoted. We didn't come this far to fail. You're nuts, Rong replied. It's been an honor, Captain. Likewise, Carl answered. God, I've had too many conversations like that in my life. The channel went silent, and Carl turned his gaze back to the main display. The icons of the shuttles and the uh, escape pods littered the space behind Avalon as the tiny vessels carrying the cr his crew set the course, their course for tranquility. He was alone in secondary control now. Soon, he would be alone on Avalon. If he was right, it wouldn't matter. If he was wrong, tranquility would still be saved. He hated the old quote from the Japanese imperialist script. He preferred the one about making the other bastard die for his country. So far as he could tell, the Commonwealth ship didn't have any QCOM-equipped Jones watching Avalon, meaning she would only see his people abandoning the ship when the light reached them and their computers drew the conclusions. Right about now. Carl did have QCOM-equipped drones near the Commonwealth carrier, so he saw when they recognized his intent. The ship rotated 90 degrees. Up relative to Tranquility's electric plane and went to fight for 53 gravities. <sighs> with a grim smile, Carl adjusted his course. Without real time information on him and with a 150 gravity acceleration disadvantage, there was no chance for the carrier to escape. Right now, they were three light minutes apart, and the distance was dropping rapidly as Avalon piled two kilometers a second onto a 40,000 kps velocity. Avalon's computer helpfully dropped a timer into his screen. Um, 22 minutes to, uh, to impact. If the carrier had missiles, she'd be launching them shortly. Carl waited. It was funny. He realized watching his own death grow in the screen, he wasn't afraid of dying. What bothered him was that if he died, he wouldn't be able to take Michael up on his offer to support him when he went back to talk to Lisa. But that wasn't quite it either, he realized. It was simpler than that. If he died, he would never be able to apologize to Lisa. And that, he realized, was even scarier to him than the thought of apologizing to her. Of course, he was apparently less scared of ramming another ship than he was of talking to the mother of his child. Carl shook his head at his own foolishness and checked the scanners. The carrier hadn't launched any missiles. If he had any of his own, his current suicide course would be unnecessary. Again and again, and again, the carrier shifted course. Five decoys fired in space, each mimicked the electronic and infrared signature of the carrier. Unfortunately for the Commonwealth, his drones were close enough to pick them up, as they launched them, keep his course on the right track. Ten minutes to impact, the Commonwealth starfighters had broken off their pursuit of SFG-001, but they couldn't possibly get back in time to prevent Carl ramming Avalon into his enemy. The question he supposed wasn't what he could do, it was what his enemy would do when he realized he was doomed. Sorry, a moth would like to guard the door, and I'd quite like it to go there. Hello, off you go. Thank you. That explains quite helpfully the momentary distractions I've been having a little bit during this. Literally, me watching a moth guy. You want to guard the door? I'm happy for you to go. So I'm not sure how I got here. At 40 light seconds, five minutes to impact, he received the first message. This is Captain Maria Jung of the Commonwealth Starship Majesty. 
a crisply dressed woman with porcelain white skin and jet black hair and the Commonwealth Navy's red and black uniform informed him. As an alternative to this madness, I'm prepared to accept the honorable surrender of your ship and starfighter, she continued. I will personally guarantee your fair treatment and repatriation to your nations. Come on. Does anyone really think that one's gonna work? And what, uh, you know, I do realize this is a book and I do realize someone would probably try that, but if someone's prepared to ram you to, to stop you winning the war, offering them a joy, a, a, a honorable surrender is probably not gonna change their mind. We've seen the Royal Navy destroyers in World War II. As an alternative to this man, this... Da, 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 da. It was a step in the right direction, but not what Carl needed. He adjusted his course slightly, adding enough of a random spiral to throw off positron lances. Four minutes to impact. Three. Captain Jun's skin was even paler when the second message arrived. Fine, she snapped. I'm prepared to negotiate the withdrawal of my forces from system. Break off your course and I'll pick up my fighters and leave. Carl considered it. The problem here wasn't the offer. If the Commonwealth withdrew, he won. The problem was that he couldn't trust her. Once she had the chance to retrieve her fighters, there was nothing to stop uh, stopping Captain Jung from sending them straight to Avalon. Right now, he posed the only threat he could ever pose. Two minutes to impact. Transmission time was down to 16 seconds, and he still hadn't replied to any of Jung's transmissions. It was an open question in Carl's mind whether or not the woman would crack, or if someone around her would. 90 seconds, Carl could probably avoid impact with even seconds of notice, but he was starting to get nervous now. 80 seconds. 70. This is Jung, the transmission finally said, her voice suddenly very small and afraid. The ridge behind her was a chaotic mess. Jung was bleeding from what looked like a bullet graze on her shoulder, and was leaning on her command chair. Carl, Carl's QCOM drones were now showing escape pods starting to fire off from her ship. To avoid further loss of life, I offer the unconditional surrender of all Commonwealth forces under my command. Please respond. Please. Carl smiled coldly. If he'd been a betting man, he would have just owed himself 20 bucks. Captain Jung, this is Captain Roberts, he said calmly into the recorder. You will stand down all zero-point cells aboard your ship. Your Starfighter crews will eject. If you do this, your surrender will be accepted. You have 30 seconds from receipt of this message to comply. Captain Jung clearly still had a QCOM link to her Starfighters. Less than 10 seconds after she would have received his message, the one solitary drone with SFG-01 showed escape modules beginning to blast through the Commonwealth fighters. In the face of the potential destruction of their only way home, even Starfighter pilots knew when the game was lost. Carl waited a few painful seconds to be sure that the distinctive signature on the zero point cells had disappeared from Majesty, and then slammed an override into the computer. With 17 and a half seconds to spare, Avalon slewed aside from her suicide course. <laughs> Let's be honest, if you're gonna do that, you might as well do that in a carrier. If you can in space. And it's one of the interesting things for us to think about. And one reason why I like talking about sci-fi when I'm talking about naval history or strategy is because you can play around with things you can't do in the normal world. <laughs> Hello, Yikas. Hello, Tasha Tsuvashul. Have you read any of CJ Jera's teen series of books? I have, but I have read in today's list. Mm-hmm. Project Rio Ura is an Adrian J. Ran across. Well, hello, Adrian J. Starters ran across a website on Space War, ProjectRio.com, many years ago. And it's really interesting analyzing the way Space Comet might look. Also analyzing sci-fi books and movies. Mm. Oh, cool. I'm now going to change lights again. Because light has changed outside, so of course I have to change it inside if I want to continue to look human. Any good space or the opera audiobooks? Actually, I have to admit, a couple of the ones I'm going to read today do come up in audiobook form, and they are pretty darn good. <laughs> now, 
Yeah, this is after Carl flew the Avalon through a battleship first, if memory is correct. Quite a humorous moment. Well, you know. Flew it for a battleship, then aim it for the carrier. <laughs> uh, it's they are a good series. I've read them all. They are fun to read. I've literally, I, I, I've literally picked these up in the last week or so and managed to read a fairly large chunk of them last week while getting other things done. I have to admit, there is one thing I find slightly strange in them. In that you have this ship, the first Avalon. There is another third Avalon in them later on. And she's the oldest ship, but she has a really cool ability to basically turn her hangar deck into her launching deck and launch all her aircraft in one go. And yes, that's a pain I can understand from clearing the deck perspective, but it means she can launch all her air group and whoosh. Which is a really cool capability. But they haven't built that into the newer carriers. They retrofitted into her to try and speed up her launch ability versus the more newer carriers, which had more launch tubes and they could cycle quicker. But at no point has anyone gone, hang on, we've come up with a really, really cool idea here that can cycle an entire air group in one go and get them literally out. And you sit down and go, I know the way militaries tend to work. If you found something that could, it wouldn't matter if it was something which you had put in as a extra to help one ship match with the rest, an older ship you'd upgraded it for. You'd look at that and go, so I can, my old ship can now launch all aircraft in one go. Pretty much get the entire flight airborne in a, a couple of seconds. Versus you lot, which can cycle quickly. Or I could have both. That would not take long. Also, um, things missing in this. For starters, the fighters are free person aircraft, which make them space draft, which makes sense in a way once you're dealing with long range uh, fighters. It's the same reason as the Royal Navy had long range, uh, their long range air crews had more than a couple of aircraft. And more than a couple of personnel in their aircraft, long range. You have a navigator, you have a gunner, you know, you have a pilot. This makes sense. But one of the things I think they're missing here is they don't is Glenn doesn't have scout air a scout planes in it. None of the ones I read have they have the fighters potentially could be used for scouting, and they're using a lot of drones for scouting, which makes them look like modern warfare. Really, it's drone scout or drone heavy reconnaissance, but. And this is the big but. How much would it really be difficult, considering all the sort of drivers talking about, to have, in this case, they're using mass manipulators to get them up to speed and be able to do their jumps, etc. So, pretty much uh, take a fighter. If you need to uh, try and adapt it so it could do a mass manipulator, it could actually do a jump itself. It doesn't need to be a long jump. It needs to be a jump it can do because you could have a carrier could jump into the space outside of system, lop, uh, drop off a few jump capable fighters to go and drop some drones off and do the scouting from long range and map out a system before going in. It would seem sensible. It would seem something I'm going to do. It's one of the reasons why I keep going, and whenever I talk about the future of space, uh, space combat and all spaceships, I sort of go, well, they are going to be one-stop shops. 
they are probably going to have some kind of missile. They are probably going to have some kind of energy weapon systems. Uh, they probably will have some kind of projectile weapon system. They will probably have to carry fighters and drones and all sorts of things. But they'll probably want reconnaissance aircraft because you don't want to go into blast in the summer and go, you know what? We're coming in hot. We have no idea what's there. Having something small, sacrificial, that you can possibly replace yourself with the help of a nearby asteroid. And it seems sensible. No, because the next Avalon um, they build is the next next generation of carriers. Uh, in fact, the next 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 generation of carriers, really. And she still doesn't have that capability of the deck launch. It just seems strange to me. Ah, Mazaski. Danny Zero is going, yeah, no presence V2 Hawkeye analogs. Bingo. The thing is, when talking about carriers, people always focus on the strike aircraft. And they're the cool, sexy ones, and the fighters. Oh, yeah, oh. But here's the great thing. The actual rear advantage of a strike of an aircraft carrier? It's often the very non-sexy thing. It's like the long-range anti-submarine warfare aircraft, and the long-range reconnaissance aircraft, and the airborne early warning aircraft. Which enable the other stuff to do their jobs. Great Hersey, reconnaissance is undervalued in most sci-fi. That it is. That it is. I don't think it is in the next book, but... Um, no, the next book isn't as good for Sir Reconnaissance, but the third book we're going to be looking at tonight has a lot of reconnaissance in it. There we go, Galacta. Now, Galacta is a slightly different kettle of fish. It really is. It's the sort of book which, well, Savage Stars as a whole is a massive space opera. Hi, Trent. Trent Langham. Space carriers live and die by their drone screen and human controllers sent to head with C3 fighters to wrangle them. Yeah.
Next one. You need FDL comms with scout drones? Yes. Kenneth, the crew of Avalon are rather a collection of Hell's Rejects even sent on a final RR in the story. Proving that other officers have misread them completely. Yes, but there again, it's a peacetime navy. There's some good interesting points made about home fleet, etc. in it, which do really remind me about the Royal Navy in the Napoleonic eras. In, not in the Napoleonic eras, in the Victorian times. There is this navy which fought a massive war, and then since then... <sighs> peacetime navying. Navying. Hmm. Um, Ben Dragon, what is the largest viable fixed wing that could launch and recover off a QE pass? Uh, uh, carry on assisted. Uh, there isn't really one. You see, uh, don't take this wrong way, Ben, but there aren't that many aircraft being produced at the moment on the type you're talking about. You're talking about some which is something which is large enough and generates enough power. to be able to supply airborne early warning but at the same time it's small enough and strong enough to sustain short takeoff and landings on a carrier and preferably stop itself under its own weight so it doesn't have to have a whole load of messy uh, a whole load of wires attached to the carrier or anything like that if you had such an aircraft available yes it probably would be better than Merlin but, honestly, the Merlin is a lot better than any other option available at the moment. And that's with current tech levels. So, that's what you're dealing with. There's a lot of people, uh, people can always get very heated. And one of the things I run into quite a lot, is they also don't go, but this would work better. And it would work better. It looks lovely on paper. The trouble is the actual thing that you need to do that doesn't exist. So, yeah. Very swordfish, as Dan says, might be able to. Um, come to think of it, uh, you see the same thing in Star Wars. The Veneta class was able to instant launch its company, whereas the victories and imperial uh, victories and imperials could not. Yeah, no. Him. Captain, we're jumping in hot in five. Gunnery officer. Do I load anti ship, anti fighter, or what sort of ammo in the guns? Captain, uh, XO. Did we forget to send recon drones again? Yep. That would be the answer. Gangs are. The lack of attention to the non sexy equipment gives new meaning to the phrase distracted by the sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's one reason why I like the Peacekeepers of Soul and the Empire Rising series, etc., which I'll be talking about in a bit so much is because they actually have the non-sexy stuff in there they have we don't have fast and light instantaneous communications so what we're going to have to do we will have to have drones going backwards and forwards carrying the information like messengers oh and guess what they will be interfered with and someone will try and take them out and they will not just exist happily and it will introduce a delay into our communications and you sit there and go this is really good because this is what it really would be like Ben, have you read the Expression 4 series by Craig Anson? I think I have a while back The out of combat roles a carrier can fill is part of why the carrier battle group is such a powerful formation Pretty much Hello Bishop Dev Squad, is this a circle of doom, me or Dr. Clark? Hopefully it's not me. But whenever I'm uh, downloading new cover, getting new cover art, that is, it does come up sometimes. So, <sighs> mainly because XSplit is being annoying to me. <sighs> no. The good thing 
about this office versus pretty much any other office I have in my house, or used to have, um, is everything's fairly close. Now, this series, Savage Stars, um, is a little bit different. And I'm going to read the introduction chapter. I don't usually like to do that. Usually, I like to give you one of the mini inner chapters and a bit of discussion in it. But this actual chapter sets up the whole book quite well. High above the muddy reds and sandy yellows of the gas giant Lapis One, the Topaz station followed its orbital track. At 8,000 meters in length, the station was a collection of differently shaped alloyed mo modules. Seemingly without an overall plan, every few years a new module would be transported from a shipyard on Earth or Luster and attached wherever it would fit, ensuring that, with the passing of time, the Topaz station became even more haphazard in appearance. Captain Carl Recker was one of the 12,000 personnel carrying on board the station. He'd been assigned quarters that were hardly any larger than the interior of a gravity car, with space for a bed and a communicator. So, that's quite a big car. Um, from the sleeping area, a narrow doorway gave access to a cubicle fitted with an all-in-one shower and toilet. A facility which Wrecker had never experienced before, and never even thought existed, and which he hoped never to encounter again. The joys of space travel, it's all brilliant and Star Trek style. Huge bathtubs, yes, because you always have space for a huge bathtub on a spaceship. And Wrecker was lucky, his rank gained him this amount of space. Most personnel had to make to do with a sleeping pod and shared facilities. He sat on the edge of his bed, his short cropped hair brushing against the ceiling, and staring stared at the communicator's uh, single screen. Position in 50L, VidCon Q32. His place in the queue hadn't changed in the last 10 minutes, and he was beginning to wonder if another technical problem had materialized somewhere in the comm system. The position on the screen updated. Position FDL, VidCom Q, 35. Wrecker closed his eyes briefly. Higher priority requests could push personnel calls down the list indefinitely. Position FDL, VidCom Q, 47. He was due back on duty soon, and he didn't seem like he was going to get his channel to Earth in time. Feeling like a SHIT for promising and missing his promised call, Wrecker typed out a message. Mum, Dad... FDL comms choked with high priority traffic. Sorry, not much I'm allowed to tell you. Everyone's trying so hard to make things right. Try not to worry. I'll give the comms another go once my shift is over. Love, Carl. Put the message into the queue. Tiny data packets like this were usually sent in a few seconds and he waited for the confirmation to appear on the screen. Message sent. With nothing keeping him, Wrecker left his quarters and entered a long, narrow, low-ceiling passage which led towards the command and control areas. It was cold, though the insulating properties of the spacesuit allowed him to ignore the near-freezing temperatures. The corridor was, surprisingly, deserted. He set off towards the operation area of the station, his boots producing a, rat a rattle from the grating underfoot. Beneath the grating, pipes and cables ran, as a reminder of how long it had been since his accommodation module was signed off for use. Anything built in the last 50 years would have had such visible aberrations hidden from sight. 
Wrecker passed numerous doors leading to rooms as tiny as his own, and even for every 50 meters, an airlift led to the levels above and below. This accommodation module was almost full, and Wrecker had learned that the military planned to attach an additional module just as soon as they could be constructed. The space station already seemed full to bursting, and Wrecker couldn't imagine what it would be like with another 10,000 personnel added to the pile. He hoped to be a long way away when that arrived. The corridor ended at a wall. To the le a left was an airlift, currently three levels below this one. A screen on the facing wall showed a feed of darkness and stars from one of the Topaz's external sensor arrays. Whoever designed this module evidently thought they were doing the occupants a favor by adding these windows. In Wrecker's experience, most people avoided them. Like the view outside drove home, how close they were to the void. Wrecker paused and swept his fingertip along a touch-sensitive area at the bottom display, and the feed right jumped between the hundreds of arrays. One view of Lapis One held his attention for a few seconds. On planet's surface, two huge storms, which appeared to, like deep red swirls of incomprehensible violence, were gradually drifting together, and Wrecker was interested to witness their outcome. Unfortunately, the collision wasn't likely to happen for a few days, so he spent a moment studying a different feed. This one of his current destination. Then he turned away and called the airlift. With a swish, the lift arrived. The car had room for one person in comfort, though Wrecker had once seen as many as six fit inside. This one was empty, and he entered, then selected level three below. A few seconds later, he exited the lift onto another corridor, like the one above. And again, the passage was empty, and Wrecker assumed this was because the next shift change wasn't due for an hour. And door, uh, a door to his right provided an exit into the command and control areas. Wrecker pressed his hand over the exit panel and the door opened. He immediately heard voices and footsteps, while the brighter light made him squint. The passage outside went left and right, personnel all wearing spacesuits, and most of them carrying tablet computers or bundles of paper, hurried in both directions, talking rapidly into handheld communicators, or taking jerky swigs from disposable cups filled with overly strong coffee. A double-width door opposite opened, revealing a room filled with banks of screen-laden hardware. Attended by a team of agitated-looking technicians, the door slid shut again just as Wrecker entered the flow of the human traffic in the corridor. He stood amongst the people, unwilling to match their pace. This module of the Topa station was as old as the joined accommodation block, but it had been extensively modernized. Cables, pipes, and maintenance panels were hidden behind panels, and the floor was solid rather than fitted with loose grating. This area of the space station was reminiscent of underground facilities back on Earth, Luster and other planets in the HPA. Wrecker sensed the differences, the faraway muted rumble of propulsion, and the slightest of vibrations only felt in the quietest of moments. Never let him forget where he was. At another lift, Wrecker descended two more levels. His impatience was already building, even though he wasn't late. The journey from his quarters to the docking station took 20 minutes on average, and while he was aware many civilians had far longer commutes, he didn't enjoy this dead time. Time when he was neither his own, nor in any way productive. From the lift, Wrecker proceeded onto the next module, which was separated by a permanently open blast door. Signs he no longer noticed hung from above, offering directions to newcomers. This next one module was home to the primary statistical analysis teams, as well as a few of the senior officers most involved with these teams. Right now, just about everyone in the stats was tasked with the impossible job of predicting the future based on numbers derived from present data. Reckon you they were amongst the finest minds in human planetary alliance, yet they'd failed to predict the Daklan attack on Luster, and now they were having to completely rethink their models. What warning they'd given about the possible destruction of planet Fortune? He had no idea. On balance, Reckon was far happier to be on the front line than having that kind of wet pre uh, the weight pressed down on him. It's a good book. Mm. Hmm. Cajun. The full deck launch for the feature was only put in just before Carl arrived on board, so long after the other carriers were built. 
Well, I'm not sure about that. A, I think it's been put in a while before then. I don't think it's a new system. It said they've been built after the new carriers had come online. But as they're already building Avalon at that time, it must have come in before they'd started construction of Avalon, the new Avalon, and the new fleet carriers. So, and they didn't put on the new Avalon. The problem is that short takeoff aircraft is a hangar space. Hide a hangar and ability to maneuver on the carrier. E2, the Viking, are near the limits of the size. They are, and let's be honest, the Queen Elizabeth, they have a big hangar, but it's not the largest hangar in the world. As usual, the British are focusing on maintaining maximum aircraft operational abilities. So it's number of sorties per aircraft, more than just pure aircraft. So there's a lot of facilities built into the Queen Elizabeth which have shrunk the size of the hangars relative to their size. It's one of the things I say that the one of the reasons I say that the Queen Elizabeth should have been about 20 to 30 meters longer. Yes, it would have meant we'd have had to work a lot harder in terms of docking and we've had to build bigger docks and they would have been slightly more limited in spaces where they could go. But honestly, it would have been very sensible because those 20 to 30 meters could have given a huge amount of increase in terms of hangar space, you'd probably be looking at an extra mm. uh, let's put it this way if you managed 30 meters, you could easily have been sticking a hangar which could have accommodated an extra 12 F 35s than the current one is. That's one. I think that having a bath on a spaceship wouldn't be that abnormal. There'd be plenty of space usually, as size is needed for heat span of the space. Yeah, but it still seems. Mm. Uh, you also have to remember the E2 and the S3s are both Katabar aircraft. Dan Freeman, calf D and D. I'd prefer alcohol to my a few of my D and D games, but hmm. Frank Kozak, hello. In space, size shouldn't be an issue. It's more it should be more mass that would limit the structure you build. I was more thinking about the use of water. And luxuries like big stateroom with personnel, bathrooms, and a spaceship would depend on the tech. If power is cheap and provided in vast amounts, then you can get the Enterprise D. Hmm. Then also, supercarrier hangar is tall enough. Google E2 Hawkeye and hang on, look at the photos. Hmm. Jiffy, why would they have paper? Why wouldn't everything electronic tech? Now, I have a theory for that, why things would still be paper. Because you have to remember your admirals of the 2020s were your sailors, well, your junior officers, of, let's be honest, most of the 19, early 1990s, late 1980s. In other words, our officers now have spent 30 years using paper. They grew up before the tech was standard for everything, and they are probably slightly more trustful paper. Plus, there is one advantage to paper which you can never forget. It's this. If you have a piece of paper in a locked cut in a locked cupboard, no one can read it unless they can open the key. You cannot scan through it on the current technologies. And probably not in space. If you've got data banks, they can possibly be scanned by a sensitive enough scanner with enough ability to know, read enough magnetic, uh, uh, find enough magnetic detail. Use paper, call me. Cajun. 
its first test was a Hessian when Rolls had to go home. Yeah, not really its first test. Its first use in years, Cahedron. They've had it there, just no one's used it. But there again, that makes sense because Avalon, the older Avalon, has been a... wanted a better word... a guard ship. Or rather, a backwater ship sitting there just because it's nice to have it on the list of ships that are available. Dan Reem, if you put too many F-35s in a hangar together, you're probably going to have little drones buzzing around before too long. Dan, get your mind out of the gutter. Well, to be fair, if you have 30 meters, you can probably store five in roughly 15 meters of aircraft. Um, so that's 10. And the reason I'm saying about 12 is because when you've got it a little bit longer, yes, you require small people, but you also have a lot more space in terms of the ship, so you can make the hang a little bit further, make it a little bit, you know, you can do sort of things which can move around stuff around. Hello, Melanie 64 Yes, sci-fi. Can't, paper can't be hacked. That's why governments are going back to typewriters. Yeah. I'm asking. I'd say in space, ship, uh, in a spaceship where you are closed in the fine space, no fresh air, and men and men doing a physical work, probably things are these are your top priority. Uh, have you been on a submarine lately? SP, I'm just thinking of the weight of paper and how much weight each of the root boxes to offer is um, fun. Yeah, it's just getting fun. And then listen, I'm very upset with YouTube for not letting me know on this. <laughs> I do the adverts, I do the things. Um... Uh, you, the first book was um, Space Carrier Avalon, and we're discussing its launching, its carrier, its launching system for its air group. Thank Peter. And sometimes it's quicker and easier to, to, to drop a quick note and send it running than it is to get a computer and sort out an email. Sometimes. I'm not picking out the Mac. I'm not. Vision. Mr. Spock, was it the prefix code for Reliant? Just a cat and captain. Let me get my binders full of computer codes. <laughs> Carl Gasser, papers are non scannable but it burns, gets wet. Yes, ex exactly. So. If I want to stop you getting access to my highly color classified files, boom, gone. Good luck getting it back. That was good. Re spaceship bath. I add the, the, the water can be used as a coolant, then be used for bathing, then be used as grey water, then filtered, or be used as a heat sink and dumped overboard. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Hmm. 
Bangaroo. What's the best way you've seen that sci-fi get around the fact that once you're out, you have FTL ships, you have no reason not to have FTL planet crackers? Well, Space Caravan gets around it with the Centuri Accords and basically rules the space fight. And then. Most of the others get around it by the ways they their FTL works. I, if they try and do it in terms of too close to planets, uh, it can cause trouble, it can blow up the ship, etc. But, yeah, I see what you mean. But also there's the fact that planets are kind of useful. No one doesn't want to blow up planets because people tend to think, presume they're going to use them. That's one of the interesting things. I haven't yet seen a good one where... They write in an alien who doesn't care about planets. I, an alien's life which doesn't live on planets. So, they don't care if they destroy them or not. And there you are saying summaries about two to three minutes after I did in chat. Yes. Don't try. Put some factions in other sci fi universes. I, uh, WK, if 40k, don't trust like from there. Handwritten documents only mean, only when sensitive topics we talk about. To, to, mm. Don't worry. Never understood the Lions love doing things the proper way. Yeah, this is true. I can guarantee you two things. If there's an ever Royal Navy spaceship, there will be it will have a bot it will A be called Dreadnought and B it will have a bell on it. That will be wrong every time someone important comes on the ship. Mission, you don't need FDL to wreck a planet. Blunt objects moving at speeds close to the speed of uh, light could devastate the, uh, the uh, econosphere. Render planet on the Yeah, that and antimatter explosions are always popular. Come on, aliens which do not care about planets. Well, Francis carries um, Cruz the Rune. The rural part, uh, those are nowhere, 1954. It's a good book on superconductors. Hmm. Race Car Meerkat. Hello. Known space is, uh, has um, uh, Durstborn travelers who give humans FDL. The Black Clouds, Black Cloud is a space born philosopher. The inhabitants in relation space wipe out higher life to preserve the galaxies. Hmm. Ring Peter. Peacekeepers in Farscape don't seem to care about planets so much, but then we didn't see them in their own space, really. Yeah, and then they recruit people from planets. Basically, they had farming colonies where they ba uh, where they recruit recruited people. I mean, how do you baptize babies in the bell in zero G? Again, this is the Royal Navy. A, there are two things you can predict. There will be babies, and they will figure out a way to do the baptism. It'll be a case of, don't worry, sir. And then there'll be a rustling noise, and there'll be an engineering officer coming and say, sir, th there appears to be a localized gravity well formed in the, the, the Padre's office, the Bish's office. I'll go in there. And they'll find a bit, and they'll, they'll find a chief going. Oh, I just tinkered with it a bit. And there was some looking at the bell going. Chief, what did you do? I just tinkered with it a bit. It's for that. It's for Danielle's kid. We can all imagine it. It's the Royal Navy. They will figure out a way. And there'll be the U.S. Navy going. Have you guys got alcohol? 
Royal Navy going, have you got ice cream? You're saying going, of course. Royal Navy going, well, get over here. It's beer and ice cream tonight. <laughs> Dan Raymond, Captain, prepare for baptism. Accelerate to 1G. That's the other option. You never see Jess P, you never see Chapman in space. Well, I, I think that's the other thing with the Royal Navy. You can guarantee a bitch will be going along. At some point, they won't get anywhere without them. Jerry Trowski, the Russians still have a sauna and a pool like the Typhoon class subs. I have a friend who's used both those facilities. They weren't that great. They were not that great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, the next book, that's from one of my favorite authors. And it's one I really can't recommend enough. I can't really recommend the, the series enough, frankly. They're just, it's just an amazing series. As usual, I changed the picture. It freezes a bit for a second. So, Return to Haven, Empire Rising, Book 3. Why do I like this series? Well, you've heard me already saying, reconnaissance. Well, guess what? They do it. Ships actually decide not to fight the enemy because they want to secure information, and they don't want the enemy to know they've got it. They actually are doing the sort of stuff you'd expect them to be doing. What other cultural services can we come up with? Japanese will call all their spaceships destroyers? Um, pfft, yes. Yes, they will be. They will all be destroyers. Um, hello, Foxy. Ah. That's good. I might have been great, but they were better than no pool sauna. Mm, yeah. So half the crews were worse than worried that the react the water in the pool or the sauna might be connected with the reactor water. I'd say probably with the car, with the Soviets car, um, it they were 
probably trying to invest in all those things so it took their mind off the fact that they were operating underneath the north and uh, the arctic ice flows where no one can get into you if something happens Ming Rogan, and I'm slightly off topic question. Opinions on the latest France, Germany drama with the fuck ass issues. <sighs> it's France and Germany. It's fuck ass. Oh. Hmm. In the nicest way, we're at the point where everyone is still wrangling about who's going to get what in the building. And when you're talking about FACAS, it's interesting, again, it comes up with quite so many other ones, Is and it comes up in this series as well. Who gets to build what, and what do they get to build? And what parts of what do they get to build? You know, the interesting thing about Return to Haven is that in it you have how do I put this play? It shows what the differing streams of development can produce in that. Theoretically, the human race have got a similar technological profile going on. But actually, the different human powers have developed very different capabilities. Some have very good anti-ship uh, uh, missiles. Some have carriers and fighters. Some actually develop carriers and fighters, but then their attacks don't work. So they stop them, and then the nation which does and didn't have them, which was going to attack by them, looks at it and goes, we think we can do this better, and we can make this work, and they actually produce better aircraft carriers and better fighters. Technology isn't linear. And it's just that there's always still going to be fights over who gets to build what. The problem with FACAS is the moment you have, when you just have France and Spain, or France and Italy, France in many ways can dominate that. They can lead it and push it because they have the largest area industry of the free. Once you have France and Germany in there, then there's an argument over who's going to get to build what. And there's always the worry for France that Germany's going to take all the development opportunities and all the construction opportunities, and the French industry is going to be left out of it. Because that's what it is. What is Tempest at the moment? Is Tempest an aircraft or is Tempest an industrial project? The answer is somewhere in between that. You know, I give you 4472. I wonder how long until the first couple gets married in space. I could see some billionaire doing it for burying rights. Has Elon Musk married yet? I thought he just had a partner who he'd had children with. That might be why they're not married yet. Jess B, I read this series based on recommend all for recommendations. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. It is good. The latest one has just come out, and there is another one coming out soon. Um, honestly, I love them. They are well thought out, well put together. It is kind of like Game of Thrones in that actually important characters who you would normally think would be safe aren't always safe. They just aren't. Van Gern, uh, what do you mean? Fighting everything is perfect self curricon. Enemy cannot report your position if they're all dead. The trouble is them being dead tends to show where you've been. It's the, I've got a load of dead ships over there. I think there's probably been an enemy ship wandering through. One is an accident. Two is a coincidence. Three is there's enemy action going on. 
Um, Calvin Gazzo, Vision. Actually, chaplains were counselors before Troy was a thing for over a millennia. If you encountered shame of such order. Yeah. Avian Embrace. Do you by any chance know if the Empire Rising will be getting paperback editions? I love the series, but I can only get the first three in print. I'm old fashioned. I like physical copy. I've heard they might be, but I would honestly look up DJ Holmes and mention it to him because, frankly, spectacular author. Really, as I said, really love the books, and I'm hoping many more to come. Most importantly, I'm currently, and this is not in this episode, uh, this book, this is in one many others. I'm looking to see what Anise gets up to. Because Anise is out there now, and you know, she's got a lot to live up to. A, she wants to not be like her father, but B, she really wants to be un like her uncle and her great uncle, who she seems to have idolized. And of course, the great uncle is dead, so yeah. Hmm. Nubina. <sighs> Lol, from the French, you have a tradition of holding small arms trials so they can steal technology from them. Um, yeah. Yes, look at what happened to Eurofighter. Yeah, and almost what happened with the um, Horizon class frigate. There's a reason the British pulled out and went for the Type 45. And basically went, yeah, you're trying to know we're going to be building our own ships. You are not making us build in France or whatever. Ah, Elon Musk is on his second wife and they have a baby and she sings. Oh, cool for her. The baby or the wife sings? I'd be impressed by the baby singing. The wife, I'm sure that's perfectly normal for an adult. I sing not very well, but you know. Uh, Dan Trim, also Royal Canadian Space Navy, very, very friendly, excellent diplomacy. Can also deploy detachments of terrifying Marines who are basically the crew told that their hockey team was to <laughs> cheating. Um. I was thinking more the fact that they no longer they now just use hockey players as their marines and their marine they're uh, they're basically their marine attachment boarding team is their shipboard hockey team and basic uh, what the captain does to motivate them is chuck the puck into the opposing ship and go go get I mean uh, you know the other crew again why have they sent the, what is this strange object they have sent into our ship what is it? What is it? What is it? Ah! That is it! It would work! Canadian's lovely! Canadian hockey! Yowza! Ben Duran, I feel Tempest is a tech project, so we have bargaining chips to buy into next year's to like with the F-35. Yeah, don't say. Um, do you get any um, Alcon Marine Solutions ads? Is it concerning I keep getting them? I have no idea, but no, I don't think so. Uh, that's got enemy action or a very fast comment just pass through. Hmm. I don't know. Re Ice Hockey Rink. Right, and let's see. I was supposed to be reading a section of this book, wasn't I? I was talking about and although it is, I can spend a long time talking about them. Mm -hmm. What I have to say, I like about these ships is uh, these books and most books I've is they have well written characters, and I mean none of them are two dimensional. There is one series in here which I do get slightly annoyed in that it will automatically state in every single book, the physical characteristics of particular of the the characters. But it does it in the it does it in the first instance and it doesn't repeat it again. And you sit there and go, 
this is so that if someone picks up a book in the middle of the series rather than the first book or the second book, they know who they're talking about. James sat in his car in his office, replaying the events of the last few days over in his head. As they had followed the course Susanna had given him and them, the trip had gone by uneventfully. After the briefing with all the senior crew, a wave of excitement had swept through the ship as everyone discovered what was ahead of them. For James's part, he was more than a little concerned. Susanna assured him that many Haven ships had used the gift, yet that didn't make him feel any more comfortable with the idea. More than once on the trip, he had wished he still had science officer Scott on board to reassure his worries. Sadly, the Admiralty hadn't found him a replacement science officer before he had left Ch uh, for Chester. He had spent most of his time giving the trip in his office, and, uh, as he ha had given Susanna his quarters and with Fox's help. He spent most of the time during the trip in his office, and he had given Susanna his quarters. With Fox's help, he had set up a makeshift bed in his office. Again, this is what I like about this book. The officer, the captain, has a steward. It makes sense. Especially on a freaking spaceship where the... It's not even as predictable as Earth, where you can sort of predict the weather and work out when you're going to be up. In space, asteroid field! Wahey! Or oh, random pirates have come in from nowhere by fast and light travel. Oh, great. Um, having someone to look after your captain makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Susanna spent a lot of time in her week's quarters, reviewing her notes and data she'd brought from Haven. James had put on a special meal for her of all the senior officers the first evening after they had jumped into the space. After that, they had shared the evening meals together in the privacy of James' quarters. James wasn't sure if they had intended it to work out that way or if it just happened, but as he spent more time with Susanna, he became to appreciate her more and more. Most of the conversation about being the future of Haven. She loved her people dearly and was desperate to see her planet retain its sovereignty. The suggestion James had made that Haven become a British protectorate was now the only way Susanna saw of that making that a reality, and she grilled him on the ins and outs of such an idea constantly. In turn, James grilled her about uh, Susanna about Haven's history and the gift. She had been much more forthcoming than the last time he had spoken to her, and yet she hadn't been able to fill him in on anything but the basics. The fact of the matter was that the Havenite scientists didn't yet fully understand the gift, and Susanna only understood half of what they did. It doesn't matter now, James thought to himself. We're about to find out for ourselves. Almost his thoughts had summoned some Lieutenant Jennings. Her voice came over to James's comm unit. We have arrived, Captain. I'm coming now, James answered. Please inform Councilwoman Rodriguez that we have reached the gift. Yes, sir, Jennings replied. And as James walked onto the breach, he was stopped dead in his tracks by what he saw. On the main hollow display, Mallory was projecting the feed from gravimetric sensors. The images were like nothing he had ever seen. Endeavour was in the middle of open space. The nearest solar system was about a light year away. Yet about 30 light minutes in front of Endeavour, it looked like there was a gravimetric superstorm. What appeared to be a number of tight weaving balls were spitting out huge amounts of gravimetric waves that intersected and crisscrossed each other. The closest thing James could liken the image to was when he had watched one of his science teachers completely boil off a beaker of water. The bubbles and droplets of water that vigorously shot into the air looked very similar to the waves of gravitational energy the thing in front of him was shooting into space. What is it? James asked. We have no idea, Mallory replied. The center of disturbances almost look like they are miniature black holes. They are certainly producing strong gravitational forces. Yet, they are nowhere near as strong as our scientists estimate a black hole should be. And there are more than eight of the disturbances. There may be more, but all the gravitational waves are making it hard to know for sure. And which one are we supposed to fly into, James said? This one, sir, Mallory said as he manipulated display to highlight one of the tight balls that was giving off the gravitational waves. It's right on the edge of whatever this thing is, so we won't have to get too close to its center. This can't be safe, James said out loud as he continued to look at the image before himself. I'm having doubts myself, Susanna said from where she'd entered bridge. She took uh, two head to look at the uh, image of the hollow display, but I assure you, it has been done before. 
I still can't believe the original Haven colonists took their colony ship through this thing. It was such a risk, Commander said. Yes, but they were desperate, Susanna said, and they did send a probe through first. Once it returned, I was able to tell the colony ship where it had gone. There was no way the colonists would have simply passed this by. They had an opportunity to get more than 50 light years away from Earth in the blink of an eye. That was everything they had dreamed about. Well, it certainly worked out for them, James said. Your people got the time they needed to set themselves up as an independent world, but now we have to use this thing to stop your leaders from shooting themselves in the foot and bringing their colony's independence to an end. So, Lieutenant Jennings, as much as I don't want to, you can take us in, James ordered. Yes, sir, Jennings said with a distinct lack of enthusiasm. Down to business, then, James said. Are our stealth systems working at full capacity? All systems are fully operational, Mallory said. Devon was equipped with the latest stealth coating and the most advanced heat sinks on the Royal and the Space Navy. It meant that when her reactors were powered down to their lowest operating levels and all non-essential systems were shut down, Endeavour became a dark hole in space. She couldn't maintain it for more than a few hours, but even then she had the same technologies all RSN ships had. By incorporating heat vents into their designs, RSN ships could vent their waste to electronic electromagnetic radiation in the space along specific vectors. This allowed them to remain in stealth mode for prolonged periods of time. The vents weren't nearly as effective as Endeavour's heat sinks, but the combination of the two put Endeavour in a class of her own. Good. Any sign of the Havenite frigate? James asked. None yet, but we are still scanning, Mallory asked, answered. They are likely to have a lot of their systems powered down. If they have been stationed here for any length of time, I imagine they will be trying to conserve power. According to the data we have on the Havenite warships, they don't have our endurance for long missions. Take us in slow then, Jennings, James said. No need to let the Havenite frigate pick us up on their gravitational scanners. According to Susanna's intel, Maximilian had to station the frigate at the entrance of the gifts to prevent her or anyone else from Haven getting to Earth. On well, James wouldn't be worried about taking on a frigate, as Endeavour would be more than a matter of such a small ship. However, Entering the gift had made him nervous. He didn't want anything to go wrong. He was also worried that if they didn't deal the frigate, it might be able to sneak up close enough to them to fire off a broadside of missiles at point-blank range. Endeavour might be a powerful warship, but even she couldn't survive a missile salvo from point-blank. I think I'm getting something, Malink said a couple of minutes later. There appears to be some gravitational waves coming from the edge of the gift. Yet they are not from any of the balls at the center of the structure. It might be a ship. It must be them, James said. Implement Plan Beta. On the journey towards the gift, the senior officers had a number of meetings where they had discussed their plans for dealing with Admiral Harris and his plans to attack the Kirillian envoy ship. They had also come with a few ideas about how to deal the frigate that was defending the entrance of the gift. See? This is like a normal operation. This is what they do. It's not... Star Trek. Ah, yes, I am the captain. I will immediately deal this process and come with this plan off the top of my head in 30 seconds. No, they've been having meetings. They've been discussing. It's what navies do. And sorry, even if they're going to space them, it's not going to change. They're going to be having discussions. You know, you don't suddenly become a senior officer. Part of the training to become a senior officer is being involved in those discussions with senior officers when you're a junior officer, when the senior officer is trying to come up with plans for the problems they're dealing with. So having those discussions is important. It's part of a Navy, and it, it works. They'd also come with a few ideas about how to deal with the frigate that was defending them just the gift. If possible, James didn't want to cause any more deaths than necessary, and he wasn't going to risk his ship or his crew. The modified stealth drones has been launched, Sub Lieutenant King said a few minutes later. We'll be in position in five minutes, Captain Jennings reported. When everything was in position, James stood up from his command chair and walked over to Third Lieutenant and Beckett, who was manning the tactical solutions station. Make sure your first shot counts. Don't worry, Captain. I have everything under control, Beckett said calmly. James rested a hand on her shoulder and gave her a slight squeeze. I have full confidence in you. He looked towards Sub Lieutenant King. Send a signal to the pro. As soon as the probe received the signal, it broadcasted James' pre-recorded message. It took less than 10 seconds for James' voice to reach the patrolling frigate. 
Even like Frigate. This is Captain Somerville of HMS Inova. I trust you know who I am. I have reason to believe you are currently keeping station somewhere within the gift. Reveal yourself now and surrender, or I'll be forced to enter the gravimet uh, gravimetric anomaly and destroy you. It looks like it's working, Subtenant Malek said from the sensor station. The frigate is altering course towards a drone. Good. Open fire as soon as you get a firm target lock, he added for Beckett's benefit. The problem they had faced was that the gravimetric systems had made it hard to lock onto a target within the gift. James had toyed around with a few different ideas, but in the end he'd settled for the simplest one his officers had come up with. They were going to lure the Havenite frigate out. It was risky in that they didn't know just how good the Havenite gravimetric sensors were, though so far it appeared James's guess was right. While their sensors were able to penetrate the gear into the gift, he had estimated that the Havenite frigate would have more of a problem with all the gravimetric waves the gift generated. The Haven, uh, Haven colony had been out of contact with Earth for more than 200 years. While they'd astonished everyone back on Earth with the size of the colony they had been on producing those years, they were still way behind Earth in all sorts of areas. Seeing the ruse had worked for the captain, the Haven frigate was operating under assumptions that Endeavour couldn't detect him. As James watched, it was clear he was trying to maneuver to the edge of the gift and into a position where it could open fire on the source of the transmission. By the time he found out he was stalking a drone, it would be far too late. Firing Beckett's ear as soon as the frigate frame came close enough to the edge of the gift for her to get a lock on it. As she spoke, the hollow display up updated to show two green plasma bolts shooting into space from one of Endeavour's plasma cannons. Hit! Beckett shouted moments later. Detecting the ship now without electronic magnetic sensors, their stealth field is down. It looks like they are suffering some power fluctuations, Malik reported after several seconds. Transmit the second message, James ordered. This time, the message came from Endeavour, and it took less than a second to reach the damage Haven Knight Frigate. Well, Haven Frigate, we have you in our sights. Surrender now. If you make any aggressive moves, we will destroy you. No change from the Frigate, sir, Malik said after a few seconds. There is no sign they are powering up any weapons. There is a message coming through now, Subtenant King reported. But don't hollow display, James ordered. Captain Somville, a familiar face said. I'm offering my official surrender. You have best of me. Please don't make my crew pay for my foolishness. Good times. It's a good book. And I like this series. I really do. I cannot sing their praises enough. Oh, let's see. Oh, we've got some messages about Starbucks going on here. What's the answer came from? Carmen, what happened to Eurofighter? Uh, basically, Eurofighter was supposed to be Anglo-French. Uh, all sorts of different projects and it ends up getting large sections of it. How do I put it? It's felt by many of the powers that Germany managed to get the best out of the Eurofighter deal. And they did, because they were very good. They worked very hard to make sure they got the best out of it. <clears throat> King's Rook, you say that, but the Royal Canadian Air Force hockey team is the only military to have an Olympic medal. Gold, of course. I am not objecting to the Canadians' cocky teams. I'm quite certain they are excellent. I just think that in a fight, if I had to pick between standing behind the Canadian hockey teams or, I don't know, any American football team, I'd be standing behind the Canadian hockey team and going, good luck, America. Um, they've got blades on their feet as well as a long back to whack you with and the same amount of body armor <laughs> in fact more of it <laughs> that's good the enemy ship crew ha huh, the grenadoes are dead Canadian force <laughs> give me back your your part of the bug or I'll treat you blind side the rookie <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, let's be honest you, you're safe from the enforcers until they take off their gloves at which point you need to be somewhere else fast Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
King Ru Tim Horton, Dirt Squad. Uh, so the person the blindsided rookie gets to face the lumpjack commandos. Um, that's the polite way of saying they've been taken. They're taken off the ice for night to save the uh, destruction and integrity of their faith. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna get. This is gonna be interesting with the YouTube. Uh, there are gonna be Canadian hockey tube, uh, hockey uh, enthusiasts coming at me, or actually agreeing with me. Possibly many of them agreeing with me. Ben Graham, are the command staff on ships done with shift rotations or vehicle response? Or is it something odd happened? Wait, the captain system. Um, it's a some. Well, look, there will be there'll be an officer of the watch, and there'll be an officer of the deck at any point, and they will rotate on duty. And they'll have seen, and they can deal with most things, but at certain points they might well go. Wake a senior officer. I if there's a problem in engineering. The probably the first person to be waking is the chief engineer before they try and wake up the captain or the uh, captain of the XO. As a rule, on most ships, usually I find you, it's very rare you don't have either the captain or the XO or the third most senior board. Usually, the, the, one of them awake in any watch. Usually, there is a senior officer wandering around somewhere. Um, there is that good example in not Red Storm Rising. Uh, oh, submarine book Red October, Red October, yeah, Red October. Where it's actually quite normal. The captain says, Look, I'm going to be having a meeting, Doc. All the junior officers are going to be in charge. I, uh, I have to have a senior meeting, and I know it's awful to not ask you to be here, but um, if you wander around, you can check on them and give them without them feeling like they're being watched by someone more senior, so we can allow them to have their head and learn what they're doing, but you know exactly where we all are. We're in the meeting room, which is literally just next door to the bridge. We can be there in seconds. And it works. And it, the thing is, it's perfectly normal. The doctor wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have. Uh, wouldn't have argued that. That would be perfectly sensible. Uh, Bishop, that comes from me. I'm sorry, I Probably wanted more collaboration and teamwork in the bridge crew. Yeah. And it is a great way for working in uh, stuff in the enterprise. But again, the thing I found interesting is that you then didn't really see it going down below. And you only ever saw the bridge crew with maybe Geordi added in. And that isn't how you would have had juniors in there. You'd have had a lot more in there than just them. And it's an oddly wise choice to surrender. That's something here. The thing is, sometimes you have to surrender. Why don't more sci fi discuss range of travel on guns? You think it would be even more important space? It is, but I don't know. They often get round it or just skip it. Adrian, what about the All Blacks? They are, there are more of them and they are part Maori. Again, very brave, very powerful people. But again, hockey sticks, body armor, blades on their feet. I'm going with the hockey players. <laughs> Against the American football team, I'd be tempted to go with the All Blacks. Um, Gurk and Kings of Rook. The Gurk question is Canadian hockey team or Gurkhas? Gurkhas. It's Gurkhas. Plus, they'd be carrying rifles. And some lovely kukuris, which could balance off the knives on feet. It's not entirely crew what the rest of the crew does in Star Trek. It seems like the bridge crew are doing literally everything the computer isn't. One of my big complaints about Star Trek. Man, 
You're sending the executive officer, you're sending all these senior leadership on away missions? Really? This is the thing, if you consider Stargate, that makes sense. Yes, they have some senior teams and some more experienced teams with men and more experienced people. But they're small teams being sent through. They're all a whole range of teams, and some of them really aren't a senior. And the thing is, it's not General Hammond going. He's sending out small Special Forces teams. It makes sense. Special Forces teams often have weird ranks in them, and there are people in there who really you wouldn't think would be doing the job they're doing, but they're doing it, and frankly, no one's going to argue them because they know about 90 ways to kill you with their eyebrows. You're not going to argue with those people unless you have to. So that makes sense. Star Trek. Oh, we're going to bring down the executive officer. We're going to bring beam that. What? Here's the thing. This is going to sound terrible, but this is what you have junior lieutenants for. There is a reason why the highest rate of the, the, the highest chart in terms of percentage of total numbers of personnel as percentage of them, their position killed, the highest kill counts in the British Army in World War I and World War II are subalterns and second lieutenants and corporals. Why? Who are the people at the front leading at the front? Second lieutenants and corporals. Why? They're the junior ones, they're there to be experienced, but they're also the ones you can risk more of. Because, sadly enough, to replace one of them is a lot easier than replacing a sergeant or replacing a captain, let alone a major or a lieutenant colonel. In combat scenarios, your lieutenant colonel, they can be as brave as anything they like, but they should not be facing the same risks as a corporal is. They shouldn't. Because their job is not to do what the corporal's doing. Their job is to command the whole battalion. Run the battle. So this is the point. When you see a commander who is the equivalent of a lieutenant colonel going down on a away mission, you're Basically going, this person's expendable? Yes, you can argue for things of, right then, that we they might need diplomatic capabilities, but they still wouldn't go first. You'd send down a security team first, or a science team, or an investigation team, or a, a, way to, a specialist away team, which is how you probably run it. You'd probably have a specialist away team of Marines, whose job it was to go first, Secure the area, and then the senior people, if you're sending senior people or the specialists, would come in behind them. Area secured. It makes sense. Apart from DSI, I should say, yes. But then they have Chief O'Brien, who basically explains what the rest of the crew are doing. And I always love that scene when they're doing a joint up with the Gem Hadar. And the Jem Hadad, the guy does this whole, you'll die, you know, our lives are for the Empire, sort of, our lives are for the Dominion, this sort of thing, for the Founders and all this stuff. And then Chief O'Brien gets his and he's giving it out to the Sergeant. And, goes, and I'm Chief O'Brien, and I am what he said, uh, I want to kill them, but I will live today, and you had all better do, or I will to bring you back to life to kill you myself, sort of thing. And yeah, that's Chief O'Brien. The really annoying thing when I'm looking at Discovery or Picard, where are the Chiefs gone? They had a really great dynamic going in DS9. They had an NCO character, and that was a really great link going on, and now they've got rid of it. Now let's see, the blades are on the bottom of the feet, unless they're on the backs, or unless they're kicking you. I think there is a British Army Gurkha hockey team, ice hockey team. And uh, Dirk's gone. I remember a hockey game between USSR and I think Canada. Canada played by NFL rules where body checking wasn't allowed in your. Uh, 
but, uh, telling a load of Russian soldiers that um, who happened to play hockey that they were allowed to be beat on the Canadians for a four minute penalty didn't go well. They mostly ignored the puck for 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, that would be normal. Melissa Roy, being the captain now too, the XO. Yeah, that's the original series. Yeah. <sighs> Dan Drowski. Hammond went, uh, went once and he flew a gunner on a needle threader fighter for Teok, the rescue mission against Hathos Force. Yes, but on both times, Hammond made a point that he wasn't doing what he should have been doing, and he was a very, very special occasion, and it was necessary from the. And. Did you notice when he went for once, he had about a dozen SG teams around him. He was literally, he was dressed as a monk and he, he was surrounded by soldiers. It was kind of like, we were taking a senior officer. There will be enough soldiers that there will be a carpet of dead, uh, dead Jem'Hadar. Uh, well, not, is it Jem'Hadar? No, it is Jem'Hadar. Anyway, that's Jem'Hadar is the, the thing. Um, where is that Jem'Hadar? Anyway, there'll be a mountain of dead wild soldiers. Just no. Do not take him on. Dan Freeman, I didn't say it, you did. Mm -hmm. Dan, wasn't he a Roddenberry US Air Force? That there, it's all officers fly, and this is said home and do mechanical yeah. stuff. Yeah. Ah, yes, Rom explaining the recycling system. That was good times. Jamie Peter, off topic. If that was only the only problem, Duska, there is a reason there is no Star Trek or Star Wars or any of those books in this list. I was asking, Star Trek Enterprise later on got Mako detachment for away missions. Yes, and that made sense. Jafar, yes. Gemini that Jeff R is SG is Stargate, yeah. Why do they like to pick for their uh, you think about it, the number of sci-fi's where the critical soldiers of the enemy begins with J. Think about that. Yeah, Star Trek Stargate is the there are two sci-fis I am really, really annoyed haven't come back. And I know they've brought Star Trek and they're doing all that stuff. But there are two sci-fi series which I've loved. Andromeda and Stargate. Because Andromeda had another two seasons in it, definitely. The way they mucked up the ending because they tried to crown two seasons worth ending into the ending is the example of that. And Stargate. Yeah. I want to see what happens in the universe. I want to see what happens with Destiny. I want at least a movie about it, Destiny. Don't go on. I think this comes from British Nail Fiction, Hornblower Kid Oreo, where the gallant post captain with a knighthood must lead Jolly Jack Tars on a suicide mission. Again, it's a slightly different world and a slightly different age you live in. And often when a captain is leading a suicide mission, it's a rather large force which is going and you need some of that rank and seniority to do it and it's going to be a big senior, a big thing. Usually, lastly, it's a, if it's a forlorn hope on the ground or if it's a fire ship, they're commanded by a junior officer who, if they survive, knows they're going to get a promotion.
Can't kind of criticize who give them Gurkhas. I wish they did, but they all seem to be J. A lot of alien names from Jaffa are British Indian Army, Jemhadar Act. Gazan, hmm. Don't know, I was asking. Just get it, they got it linked in. The. Hmm. Brad Wright is in talks with MGM for a new Star Wars series days, not a reboot. Hmm, that's good. That's good. And the number of sci-fi enemies who decide to give their slaves all the guns makes me wonder how... Yeah, we, I will never understand that one. It's like... You're surprised that Jafar are rebelling? Really? You've given them the weapons, you've taught them how to use all the ships and all the technology. They do all the work for you because you don't trust other Gwald. And you're surprised they're able to rebel? Really? Which brain dead person are you? So this is the next book, and it's an Eric Thompson one. As you know, I quite like his books. I have to admit... I'm going to have to do something at some point where I do find some, uh, go through some decent books um, that I can sort of put it, uh, put up here, which may cut some of the balancing. But <sighs> these ones are also ones which have cool covers, which I know is quite liked, quite important for displaying. All right. Carmen, have you ever heard of the KDF battalions of the Polish underground in World War II? Yes, they're pretty good. Champion, Stargate Grand tried Gurkhas, but they were considered OP and too unfair against the gold. Hmm. That would have been true. Van Grohn, the soldier rank, who was the highest rank on the ship, com uh, on the ship commander in the reign of the sun's there? Captain. So we wouldn't do a full colonel. I think there might have been a colonel wandering around as well on the uh, on the land side. I mean, that weapons of uh, Jack and Carter gave the rebels where they explained how the P ninety is a weapon of war is freaking awesome. Yes, it was. Weren't Jafar carrying infant golds in their pouch? Yep. Hmm. It's fun times. I like this book, The Ashes Empire. I do like this series by Eric Thomason. Um, it's an interesting series because it's not a straight up normal sort of the battles you'd get. It's more thoughtful than that. It's got content in there. Now, <laughs> mm. 
This is the author of also the, the um, Siobhan Dunmore books, which I also quite like to read for you guys and girls and everyone. But, um, yeah. This is the la this is the ch end chapter, and this is what I like about this series because this series is obviously written as a series. It's not written as individual books. You can pick up an individual book and carry on and work out where it is, but it also it does good a lot of work to continuity going through the books. You're looking well, sir. Bridget Descartes said, a smart at Jonas Monrain, as she climbed out of the staff car that brought her from Government House to Vanquish Bay. <laughs> She was traveling without her own retinue, not even Commander Lutzow and her close protection team had joined, Mora joined Moraines in watching over his estate the moment her air car crossed its perimeter. Looks can be deceiving, and don't call me sir. I think we presidents can use our first names in public as well as in private. Protocol be damned. Congratulations, by the way. I remember you weren't keen to take the job, but the Senate chose wisely. She made a distinctly unpresidential face. Thanks, I think. Moraine gestured. At the gaping front door to his house where Emma Reyes waited. Please come in. It's been too long. You missed a lot during your enforced timeout. Apparently, Moraine and Reyes, uh, uh, Moraine and Reyes led her to the salon, where a tray with drinks waited. I'm still catching up. I understand your nomination to the presidency went unchallenged. The card sat in what was once Gwen, Gwyneth's favourite chair and accepted a chilled glass of white wine. Victor Arco couldn't drop his candidacy fast enough, seeing as how he was tainted by association with Stern, the Farrar assassin. And with Charis dead, that left the acting incumbent once, uh, once most Senate's challenges financed by Hecht and his cronies either dropped out or lost their bids. Say what you like about Arco, he's a shrewd operator who knows how it went to fold his cards. She should, uh, took an appreciative sit. It seems that I am, in the option of certain, opinion of certain political analysts, what is known as the steady hand on the tiller steering our ship, our, our state. And those analysts aren't wrong. You have been my personal pick if it weren't for my conviction an outgoing president shouldn't put forward the name of his or her successor, even indirectly. Despite Elena Yankin's discreet lobbying on my behalf, I'm not surprised Victor backed away. He and I may not agree on much, but he has good instincts, the sort that kept him out of trouble both politically and personally. I mean, go so far as crediting with a personal sense of honour. Not me, but that's beside the point. I doubt he'll seek public office again, and how are you feeling? Moraine took a sip from his glass and shrugged. Physically, I'm fine, though I need to rebuild my muscle mass after so long in hospital bed. Emma's making sure I exercise religiously for at least two hours every day. She installed a gym in one of the empty bedrooms and asked the groundskeeping staff to cut a running path along the bay. He felt silence as if searching words, but there's an emptiness inside me. A chunk of myself missing. I still have my memories and my emotions and my thought patterns seem intact, yet I feel like a shadow of what, who I once was. Sister Amelia tells me that in time the emptiness will fill up as I keep on living, and my soul finds renewed purpose. It won't be the same, but I'll no longer qualify as the hollow man. She's quite the mind hitting meddler herself, our Amelia. I doubt I'd recovered this much without her help. We've had long discussions about her part in the Stern Rogo saga, and she now sees matters the same way as Marta. He gave the cord a crooked side. Yes, I realize you trust them even less now that Martha revealed their innermost secrets. But keep in mind, Stern was an anomaly, one which will not be repeat itself. The Order has been instrumental in helping us build a resilient lioness in a galaxy gone mad. We mustn't let one deranged friar destroy everything. Oh, I understand that. We need them just as much as they need us, but no more picking up wild talents in ruined star systems unleashing their pent-up abilities. That lesson will become part of the Order's rule, believe me. Emma and I spend a few evenings wa here watching the sunset with Martha, discussing the future since my release from hospital. She has a clear vision of what the Order should be and the will to make it happen. Mind you, we won't be leaving this branch of the wormhole network in our lifetimes, or even our children's lifetimes, what with the barbarian plague ravaging humanity. I won't be so sure. That ship full of undamaged bodies killed by the pathogen rather than our gunfire is giving the university's researchers, including some damn good Order of the Void religious, undreamed of insight into the plague. They figure the virus is probably close to burning itself out if it hasn't already. The biowarfare agents, by their very nature, shouldn't be persistent. 
Otherwise, what's their use, right? Turns out we've been overestimating at the time the virus remains live. The various intrusions weren't from the same outbreak, but different ones. The last bunch was infected long after the first one appeared at Outer Picket. Besides, chances are good infected barbarians didn't speak to spread the plague beyond the Colsac. They only came close to Lionessi in such numbers because would have but last bust in the civilization for hundreds of light years. What about an antiviral? That's the wonderful news. They figured another two to three months, although there's no way of testing it on anything more than lab-grown human tissue. So even if it proves effective under those circumstances, we can't change our policy on incoming starships. The card sipped her wine, eyes on the shimmering waters of the bay. Now that you're officially an elder statesman, can I ask you a few favors? Of course, anything. Since I don't trust the Order of the Void, will you be my intermediary with our best smarter? Certainly, though she's withdrawn the order from the Estates General and every other secular body not concerned with medicine, psychology, religious matters, or teaching, you won't see or speak with her much in any case. She plans on returning the brethren to their monastic roots and undoing centuries of increasingly secular investment involvement in human affairs. Moraine paused for a few seconds. I don't think I ever told you. But long ago, when Marta first arrived on Lionessi, Gwyneth told me she would play a big role in Lionessi's future that she might be charged with protecting the spark that saves humanity from eternal darkness. Maybe we're witnessing Gren and Gwyneth's prophecy come to life. Shrugged again. I was never one for mysticism, but I must confess there's something about our new Summus Abatasa that transcends what most of us consider normal. You said a few favors, what else? Lioness E Defense Force Command and Staff College, will you become its first chancellor? Moraine gave her a surprised look. You're not putting a flag or generals in charge? I decided I'll reserve the position for a tired flag or generosas. More stability, less internal politics. You'll be reporting to a board of governors named by the Defense Secretary and appointed by yours truly. The Chief of Defense Staff has final say on the curriculum, the appointment of uniformed staff members and the budget, but the Chancellor can appeal decisions with which he disagrees. I accept, but you already figured I would. Jonas Moraine spending his days gardening or playing the Boulevardier in downtown Lanyon simply doesn't compute. The first intake is in Fremont. The facilities are almost built. Defense Secretary Briner has a list of proposed civilian and military staff waiting for approval. And Antrian Barker signed off on the current curriculum you proposed last year. Reginus Brenner came out of retirement. I'm impressed by your powers of persuasion. Don't be. He wanted a job, but wouldn't say anything while I had it. That's our originus, Moraine raised the glass. I can't believe I didn't do so yet, but I propose a toast. Uh, but I propose a toast to President Bridget the Card. The Republic is in good hands. Here, here, Emma Rice imitated him to our president. They took a sip. Then she said, "I'd like to propose next toast to a friend whose absence leaves both of us feeling hollow." I know Jonas misses Gwyneth something fierce. Though you won't admit it, we both do. She was a steadfast friend. Moraine nodded. Aye, from the moment she first boarded Vanquish. The guard raised the glass to Gwyneth. I'm sure the Almighty took good care of her soul to Gwyneth. Rose and Moraine raised their glasses as well. The card could have sworn she saw a bit of moisture in the corners of Moraine's eyes. Binding to Republican Lionessy. Long may she continue to shine as a beacon for humanity's re uh, rebirth. Now, I have to say, I do enjoy Eric Thompson's work. I'm at least slightly more. I have to put, uh, how do I put this politely? Slightly more. You do have to read the whole series, really, to understand all the inside jokes that come into it. And there are a lot of inside jokes to come into it. Um, but it's worthwhile. And I'm looking forward to the fourth one of these books when it comes out. It's going to be a good book. I know that. Right then, what questions have I missed while reading? Mm, right, I think I got to that one. Um, to do. -do. And Carl Gus went, but they still kept the name of the sun room while they're, hmm. Richard, Dr. Clark, 
Have you read The Boats of Sherberg? The Navy stole, uh, stole its own boats and revolutionized naval warfare by about Israeli missile boats. Um, I did a while back. When it first came out, I've got it somewhere. And coming on, and the slave races. The Habsburgs, however, played rather well, pitting one nationally ethnic group against the other century. It also ended ugly, though. Yeah, so did pretty much every imperial empire. But um, hmm. Then, from Beowulf, it can be very persistent, very, very persistent. It can be, but on an interplanetary scale. Hmm, possibly less so. Hmm. Oh. Most of these little guns that we often talk about, it's one of the interesting things is that when you start looking at the combat scenarios, and that's definitely, if we go back to carry, uh, Space Carrier Avalon, the Marines there, they wear, they're wearing a full bodysuit which weighs about a ton. That's the thing, they've got, they're, they're, it's a boarding suit, it's got automatic cannons, it's got a rifle built into it, it's got all these things. They're basically a full battle armor, and you start to realize that is probably the way it's going. It's kind of like, uh, I, I have a theory, the reason the British Army is so obsessed with maintaining light infantry is they're banking on the idea of eventually getting all those battle suits in and being able to turn around everyone going, aha, you all focus on tanks and APCs, yes! Well, look at us. We've now got hordes of these mechanically advanced infantrymen that will bash you to pieces. And then everyone else will turn around and go, yes, we've got those same troops, but they're in, they're in vehicles which can move them quicker. Rishan will then go, ah, sod. Didn't see that one coming. Ah, frick. We might actually need an armored section. Oh, cavalry. The British Army does seem to have a love-hate relationship with cavalry. In that, cavalry are these very prestigious units which need these very special senior people to command. They're, they're wonderful, they're prestigious and all this. And they're always trying to reduce their numbers and get rid of them. Mm hmm Me versus a bit, I'd rather have a tank or a 40-60 lever action. Hmm. Don't run from uh, British Army with Battle Sand Infantry will still have Gurkhas in Slash House carrying Gur uh, Kukuris. Well, yes, because the, the you know the battle suit of the Gurkhas will have lots of have Kukuris which will come out of each arm. You know that. You also know they will have the slouch hat because they'll have a helmet which can be put in place, but they're Gurkhas, they will go, helmet off, hatch on. And in case of, it would be like looking at the 40k where you've got the officers whose head is out of their armor, fighting away, yeah. Um, you know, all the other space marines have got their full armor on. It'll be fun.
Um, right, that'll be... Right, that's a next to you pictures. Made sure they're all up and, they're up and ready to go. Sorry about that for a second. So, it's... Um, call to arms next. Ba -ba -da -ba -da 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 -da. O to eighteen. All right. All right. Ever wonder about the Hungarian or Prussian space of ours? Power armor with robot horse. Carl von Gasberg, please don't scare me. I, I like my beautiful wife. Mission, Dutch Clock, why do you have to go with a 57 millimeter instead of 76 for the LCS and new frigates? Because they've got enough 5 inches that if they go for a 76, they then start to get into the area where it's, um... Iffy. Plus, 57 millimeter offers you potentially a higher rate of fire. Uh, you can help. And I love Bernard Cornwall comment but that between cameraman and the horse, there is only one brain. Usually the horses. Um, also, the very intelligent animals. And vision. The Israelis went for the new seventy-six millimeter for the missile boats, then the forty millimeter both of us because it had greater range and punching against ships. Do I ensure bombardment? Mm. Basically, you are you very rarely pick weapons in their isolation. This series is actually a fairly good example. Of this you pick weapons as a function of what they offer, in complement to the other systems you have. So, if you are planning on having a big eight-inch advanced gun system, or railgun, whatever you're planning on having, then suddenly you're going, right then, what does a 76mm offer me against 57mm that I don't, I don't need to do? Well, do I need it in land attack roll? No. Okay. Then I'm looking for the air defense roll. Okay, so it offers me slightly longer range, but not enough that makes enough difference versus 57mm, which offers me a lot higher spec firepower. And the thing is, it's easier to double up a 57mm if I need to in the future than it is to double up a 76. I'm not saying you can't do it, it's just easier. It's slightly smaller and just slightly easier to do. And you can do a lot with a 57mm. So that's it, basically. It's like, why did the Royal Navy go with the 40mm Bofors and a 50mm for the Type 31s? Well, because if you're producing a flak frigate, it makes sense. Why have a 76mm? That's gonna just, that's gonna give you an extra range. Yeah, wonderful. But that's not your envelope range. Your envelope range is the range in which you can bring all your guns to bear in your air defense role, and the 40mm and 57mm will complement each other far nicer in that one than the 76, which is better for slightly longer range. Unless you're going to load it with a load of shrapnel shells, which then brings it closer, slightly closer. So, <clears throat> it's got to be worked out in sympathy and concept with them. 
So, Call to Arms. J. Allen's book two, Blood and Stars, book two. It's a good series. It is. Um, Orbital Platform 1, Alex the Elia, a Casapos 3. 308 AC. Commander, I understand Dauntless was badly damaged when we returned, but it's been four months. I've read all the status updates, but frankly, they are somewhat vague regarding dates. I really need to know when she'll be fully operational. Oh, good lord. And this is something else which is going to come up in sci fi, and it's some of the interesting things I have. You are going to have different facilities at different spaces. The shipyard, the, your main shipyards are going to be able to do, do little work far quicker than your more distant shipyards because they're going to have more people and it's going to be an easier job. But they are probably also going to have a bigger queue waiting for them and more complicated jobs coming to them. So there might be an advantage to going to a local shipyard. In which case, is it a civilian or a shipyard? Or is it a, is, is it an, an, a forces shipyard? What is a shipyard? What is relation going to mean? These are all things to get into a sci-fi. Um, 40 millimeters both fours, 57 millimeters, um... Mm, not both fours, it's BAE. Mark 110 mount, and it's, um, it's an interesting gun. Tyrone stood next to a clear hyper polycarbonate wall of the space station, looking out at this battleship. Dauntless firmly attached to the station by a series of massive docking cradles. He'd been her captain for over a year now, and he had led her ship in one of the most desperate and deadly battles imaginable. Yet he realized now that he'd rarely seen her from the outside. The battleship was almost four kilometers long. Whitish gray metal, with huge structures projecting out on each side, her landing base. She was beautiful in her own way. Almost symmetrical, but with just enough irregularity to give her a charm, at least in her devoted captain's eyes. Especially now that her wounds had been healed, the outer ones at least, there had been long gashes in Dauntless's hull where she'd arrived back at Ikea, yeah, and half her laser turrets had been blown to bits or melted down to slag. Barra Aaron could see small specks on her hull, barely visible from this distance. Suited technicians, he realized, working all along Dauntless's exterior. There are repair boats moving around her too, some of them hoppers carrying supplies, others work ships extending giant robotic arms to very repair various damaged areas. Near the bow, two larger craft were easing a large turret into place, a replacement for one of Dauntless's destroyed secondary batteries. Captain Baron, I have three full crews working around the clock. We are a remote base. I'm afraid, and our priority for supply requisitions is quite low, especially since the war began. We've had to improve some work around, uh, improvise some workarounds for replacement equipment we just didn't have. That takes time, Commander Farnall stood facing Baron. Clearly slightly intimidated by the captain's renown, both inherited from his grandfather and since his return from the battle on the edge of the rim, newly earned, Varno was the officer in charge of Achilles' base repair facility and a target right now of Baron's impatience. So you've heard the Confederation is at war, have you? Perhaps there might be a use for another battleship at the front, don't you think? Baron knew he wasn't being fair. Farnor's statements were nothing but truth. From the reports they'd been receiving from the front, things weren't going very well. He had no doubt every spare part and new system had been diverted to damage vessels far closer to the front. But he didn't care about the fairness now. Confederation was at war, and he and his people were sitting it out in some backwater, light years from the action. It was intolerable. Captain Baron, I know you're anxious to get underway, but it takes time to repair the kind of damage Dauntless suffered. Farnar paused, exhaling hard as he turned to look at the great battleship. One month, Captain. I will add another crew, and we will do everything possible to have her ready in two weeks, Commander. Baron looked back at the frustrated officer standing next to him. Dauntless will be depart in two weeks, so I trust you'll get everything done by then. Farnar re returned to the stair. No mean feat when the eyes gla glaring at you were those of Rance Baron's only living descendant. 
Captain, I'll make it easier for you, Commander. In fact, I can offer you some assistance. Dauntless's entire engineering team has selflessly volunteered to cut their shore leave short and report for duty. He glanced at the small Cremontra's comm unit. Commander Fritz should be here any minute. Fritz was Dauntless's chief engineer, widely considered the best and most terrifying in the fleet. She was a legendary taskmaster and Baron could see in Farner's expression that her reputation had spread to Achelia. Captain, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Meshing our operation styles on a project already this close to? Don't worry, Commander. I think you'll find that Commander Fritz is tireless. I'm quite certain she can help you reorder your workflow and expedite the work here. He looked over his son officer's shoulder. Fritzy, he called out. His engineer was stepping out of the lift on the far side of the bay. Come join us. <laughs> He waited until the diminutive officer was closer, and then he said, I'm just telling Commander Farnar that I thought we could get Dauntless ready for action in two weeks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely, sir. I'll have to have a look at the duty logs, and of course inspect the work that has been done, but I'm sure we can meet that deadline, she smiled crookedly. At least no one's shooting at us now. That's got to make things easier. Farnar shifted nervously on his feet. He looked like a cage animal trying to find a way out of a trap. He opened his mouth to say something, but Baron spoke first. That, and then it settled. He looked right at Farnar. I think you'll find Commander Fritz and her people to be a dynamic force. One that can't help but speed the project along. Farnar looked for a moment as though he was still going to offer some protestor argument. But finally he just let out a breath and said, Yes, Captain. I'm sure there'll be an enormous help. Now you know why I like these books. They have... Humor in them. Or in this case, some poor engineering officer just looking at his future and going, the next two weeks of my life are gonna suck. Vision, thank you, Doctor, for the for explanation. Yeah. Hmm. Cars, BAE bought both us. Yes. But both us are kind of like the company which owns Volvo. In that, um, how do I put this politely? Okay, Volvo used to be at one point owned by Ford. And Ford handed what they thought was a complete car to Volvo that Volvo would just rebadge and style it and then would sell it as theirs. And the actual Volvo version of the car had something like 2,000 changes done to it. So much so, it had pretty much no commonality with the Ford car originally given to it. Um, and that's Volvo versus Ford. Uh, that's Volvo's relationship with Ford when Ford owned them. Uh, BAE's relationship with, mm, uh, how to, with both us is kind of like... Um, we own you. You do? How cute. We're going to go develop a gun now. Uh, would you, could you please develop it this way? You, you want it for that now? Or we'll figure something out. A few months later. Here's the gun we developed. That doesn't fit on any of our mounts. Oh. Well, you're going to have to develop a new mount, aren't you? Be going. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Bang on, shipyards and dry docks are often interchangeably in fine uh, fiction. Have you seen any that make a distinction? Need your shipyards have been had that may have built slipways, not adapt for repair facilities. Um Again, Empire Rising does actually a difference between repair yards and and um, shipyards on the different roles of them. And the fact that repair yards have to be built higher up, have to be built outside of a planetary atmosphere, because you might not want to bring a damaged ship into a pl ship planet's atmosphere. Or that near a planet. Uh, Bishop, uh, since the USN and the US, uh, Coast Guard are sanitizing on a military, I was thinking that in the interest of sanitization, a future Corvette and patrol for the USN should out the 50 millimeters too instead of the 76 or 40 millimeter. Probably. 
King's Road. To be honest, I'm not liking this captain. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's an okay captain. Honestly, he's a better when he's an admiral, but he's an okay captain. Alan McWolf, just got back from the lake. Mm, cool. Derp's got two weeks. You consider themselves lucky. Yorktown repair crew got two days. Uh, ain't Ch Volvo Chinese now? Or was it Saab? It's um, Saab. I think Volvo are cell phone now, or somehow. Or, or, or is it Indian? I'm not sure. They got bought by an investment firm, which basically said, go off and build Volvos. Kingsford, pretty sure you're thinking of the time GM sown Saab. I think that was also the same experience of GM with Saab, but in this case, I was thinking of the experience of Ford with Volvo. What Volvo Ford, uh, Money 640, what Volvo Ford car was that? The one which was supposed to produce the little V40 hatchback. The, you know, that baby car in the range. Dan Kroon, that's good. That's Clark. Um, HS Prince Wells, we're going to see dock workers. Okay, we'll get off now. Um, Prince Wells, sorry, meant to say, we've left the harbour and are now mid ocean. Off to find the Bismarck. Can you fix our world we've got going on? It wasn't quite that bad. They were a trial crew, which were there, so, and various fitters, you know. Jim here, off topic. I wonder how much both of us actually made selling 20mm to literally every side of Model 2. They must have felt like they were printing money. Uh, both of us were one of those companies which left World War II very, very rich. King's Road, I remember Clarkson telling that same story in a Saab perspective. Yes, you can get the same story. Basically, in the nicest way, do not buy a Swedish... A, 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 Swedish, Norwegian, any Scandinavian manufacturing company. They have no concept of they are owned by you and they're supposed to do what you tell them to. Okay? They just do not understand this concept. It's going, you own us. Yes, well, someone else will own us in a few years, decades. It doesn't matter. Just be happy. We're off to design and do what we want to do. We'll send you a bill later. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Also on Wikipedia, Volvo is now Chinese, owned by Geely. Hmm. I thought it was an Indian firm. Uh, now. Dan Freeman, North America was asked to build the P40 for Britain. And said, went, I'm sure we can do better. And came with the P51 Mustang. Hmm. There are lots of funds with auto companies. There are lots of funds fun with parts of auto companies. It's just non-stop the fun. That lady. Ding. So what is the next one? Ah yes. Raven's course, especially like this one. I like this book. I really do like this series. Um, it's a really, really cool series.
Dan Freeman, that sounds like Terry Pratchett and Opera. You put in money, you get Opera. You buy a Swedish car company, you get a Swedish car company's product. Hmm. I probably should. Now, why do I like Raven's Core so much? Because whilst I have a feeling it's building up to a big war, it isn't about fighting a big war, it's about the legacy of a war. It's about dealing with the problems caused by... Well... By war. By a very long war. I also have to say there are quite a few of these books which have cranial implants, which I rather like the idea of because they keep going and they prove they remember things for you. And I'm just sort of going dyslexic here. I love that. Great. Finally, I would not be sitting standing in front of someone for about ten minutes going. So how are you? How is the has significant other um you know as if it's a quirk i'm asking not because i cannot remember if you're married what your other's name is who you are just give me a freaking clue i'm one of those few people in the world who would really like because i can recognize people's faces anywhere i want to go was recognize face i would like them to wear name tags seriously there are a few people i can just about remember the name of but it'd be so much easier if people who I didn't regularly meet or talk to or didn't watch YouTube videos of on a regular cases, which is why Dan Freeman is quite so easy for me. Um, can name tags on them. I know it'd be a data protection nightmare and you can't do that, but seriously, I mean, my life's so much easier. Hence the, the implant with the remembering the name thing's great. Miss P, I like that mental injury is treated with the same level of care and concern as physical injury is in serious. Yep, that is a good part of it. It's very good. I also like the fact that the troops in it are believable. Soft and the ground forces in these things are just not used to their and go, eh, what, why? This lot, they're believable. Ben Freeman, I'm like that. I, he, says, he doesn't remember names, but I remember patient stories, collection of problems. Yeah. I remember facts about the life. As soon as I start telling facts about the life, that usually lets me link in and I can find some sort of name. Or alternatively, I have a nickname for you when I remember it. And I'll then look at the context of the company I'm in and decide whether I can use it. Many people find the nickname endearing. There are some people who I actually do have nicknames for because it's endearing and because, you know, that, you know that's part of our relationship. But um, most of my students who I have nicknames for, it's because, sorry, and you know this, because I've told it to you before, because I forget your name. Mm hmm. So, I'm going to start off with a bit I really, really like, and then it goes into another chapter, which is also very good. So long as no one moved, they didn't drift off, but by the time gravity actually turned on, Sylvia had ensconced herself in the chair, the chair set up for her negotiating table with carefully arranged tools and food around her. Oran Aval had done the same, hooking herself into the chair carefully and hanging onto a bulb of water as she drank. Rising Principal joined them several minutes moments after the gravity 
uh, cut out, and the Antony's uh, trilateral tendrils prove surprisingly graceful in zero G. We is our trapped, they admitted. Fate time must will come, I wonder. Ambassador, Aval asked, her tone amused. If we is all trapped anyway, perhaps we should complete our discussions, the Antony told them. If we live, a fate calls for peoples can we, uh, we will have set. If we die, we will can have distracted ourselves in our final face time. The Cozen chuckled. A surprisingly warm sound. I think, Ambassador Rising Principal, that if we survive this, there'll be far different discussions to be had, she told them. The Drifters betrayed us all. I think I cannot prove they fired the weapons in my people's launchers, but I know we came here for peace. This treachery will be answered. And I think both our peoples are better served if we answer it together. Do you not? This can will be a possibility, but peace must will be established first, Rising Principal told her. The Curzon voices will take formal responsibility for the invasion, recognize the cluster's borders as we were discussing, and pay an indemnity of 100,000 tons of refined palladium, Oran Aval said flatly. In exchange, we want a non-aggression pact for 10 years, a good faith attempt to negotiate trade rights, and a mutual defense ag against other aggressors. Does that suffice for the Latar cluster to accept peace with the hierarchy, Ambassador? Sylvia had a decent idea of what the Latar cluster had wanted out of the negotiations, and unless she was severely mistaken, Oraval had just offered the Rising Principal's entire wish list. The third voice of the Curzon was angry, and the Drifters were going to regret betraying her. Which was fine in Sylvia Tovarish's books, the Drifters were going to regret betraying her too. Sir's ambassadors, Trosh interrupted. We have a problem. The Guardians are splitting up, and as Ambassador Todovich predicted, one of them is coming here. If the soft chime had been an internal alarm, it probably would have failed to wake Henry up. Since it was his internal network, and it had almost nothing to do with his physical hearing, it actually couldn't fail. Must be bloody annoying. Uh, to his surprise, he'd managed the three hours of sleep he'd set the alarm for, checking into the status reports as he quickly showered and dressed, and told him that the drifters were being surprisingly cautious. They'd spent hours positioning two of the surface uh, the ships to sweep the entire meteor swarm from the outside, while the third swept back along the course Raven had followed to get here. Now he could see the search and rescue shuttle sweeping the debris cloud that had been 60 drifter starfighters, and understood their mission. From their vector, though, the Guardian was going to continue on to the original ambush site and likely sweep for Kozen escape pods from there. Somehow he didn't think anyone they rescued from the UPSF Latar or Kozen wreckage was going to be well treated. Sir, it's so fine again, her message popped into his network. Do you have a moment? I'm awake and the drifters are only now vectoring into the meteor swarm. Henry replied, what's up, Cag? I need you on the flight deck, sir, she told him. We need to talk about this mess. You can talk to me now, he pointed out. Props are necessary, his Cag replied. Be here in five. Henry arched an eyebrow at blank, uh, the blank wall. That was mildly inappropriate and subordinate, but he was used to that from Starfighter pilots. He pinged OK. Exo, any idea what's going on with O'Flanagan, he asked. She wants you to sign on putting our last two missiles on our fighters. I know that much, I beg replied. I take it she pinged you as soon as you were awake? She did, Henry confirmed. Wants me to meet her on the flight deck. Can't hurt. He shrugged. Status? We're embedded in a hundred plus kilometer ice cube, and someone is about to come hunting for us with a laser, his exo suggest said. So far, everything I see suggests we're well hidden, and it will take them time to find us. I'm just not sure how much time we're going to have. I'm hoping for about 38 hours, Henry Set replied, checking his network for the time. That's why we had a bunch of, laid a bunch of traps and distractions. Surprise, they haven't triggered any of them yet. My read is that they think they have all the time in the world, I would hear reply, said. It'll be four days before the last regular drone reaches Latar. Without knowing about Scorpius, they've got to think they have at least a week. And if they know about Scorpius, Admiral Cussigan is going to need a, to launch a Bloodman Witch Hunt, Henry said. Nothing farther out than Zion knew anything except us. If that leaked, Intel Dev is going to be very, very busy. Indeed. Do you want me to check in once you're on the flight deck? Yes, Henry confirmed. Just link in. There's no need for you to be physically present. She's probably right about answering answers. They're the last real weapon we have. 
The flight deck was a busy hive of activity when Henry stepped into it. On one of the largest open spaces on the battlecruiser, it played host to their eight starfighters in bays along each side. Lights glittered in those bays, highlighting the still odd looking form factor of the new fighters. One of the bays was dark, but enough light crept in from the rest of the bay for Henry to see the massive hole torn through three quarters of the length of Raven 1. There you are, a Flanagan said, emerging from one of the several robotic trolleys running around the deck. Catch! Instinct was enough for Henry to grab the package she tossed him with ease, and he stared down at the familiar colours and bundled shape of freshly fabricated flight suit. What's this? he demanded, suddenly completely off balance. The flight suit was marked with his name. His rank insignia. Even the entirely non-regulation red gold wings of an ace who'd flown in the first campaign against the Kenry. It's a flight suit, O'Flanagan said with exaggerated patience. Raven's fabricators have your size on file. It's synced with Raven 8, though you'll want to double check everything. Stop, Henry ordered. The pilot stops. Henry gestured. I okay, link in. He snapped. A virtual image of the XO appeared between the two of them. Presented to them both by their internal networks. Lay it out, Commander O'Flanagan, he told her, fast. We can't launch missiles from the bottom of a hole that's now twice as deep as Raven is high, the Kang told him. We're barely clear to get the SF-130s out around the hull, but we are clear. But we fired off all our missiles in the engagements with the Drifter Starfighters, and the entire battle cruiser is down to 36 missiles total, she said. So the XO didn't want to approve loading the Starfighters at your authority. Seven starfighters, 28 missiles, Henry said aloud. <laughs> that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't even leave Raven with a full salvo, so I see the problem. Not following on the flight suit, though. Two of my pilots, Lieutenant Bradovich and Lieutenant Commander Pham, are in the med bay, Flanagan told him. Lieutenant Commander Gaunt is dead. His quarters were va vaporized when we got hit. So I have seven fighters and five pilots. Five fighters only need 20 missiles, but I don't want to trust a single 20 missile salvo to take down a Guardian. If I give you the missiles, they'll all be full penetrators, Henry told. That will help. The odds are still better with 24 than 20, she replied. And as it happens, there is someone else on Raven qualified to fly an SF-130. That someone is a double ace with more fighter-on-fighter -fighter kills than anyone in the fighter wing and is the third-ranked pilot on a ship for fighter-on-starship kill participation. No, IOT, so I just finally caught up. We cannot put the commanding officer of a United Planets uh, uh, Star Force capital ship in a goddamn fight starfighter. That's a violation of at least six different regulations. Regulations about a captain leaving their ship? Who would have thought? Enforcing those regs would fall on Commander Thompson, Henry pointed out. It was probably unfair of, uh, of him, but it was true. But even putting that aside, Commander O'Flanagan, I only have virtual hours on our SF-130, never have flown one in real space, which put, still puts you ahead of our shuttle pilots who are not Starfighter qualified, period, she told him. Sir, you've kept up your virtual and real space hours to keep your wings. You're qualified to what fly 130. There are only six unwounded people in this ship I can say that of, she concluded, and taking out with us, if it comes down to it, might just save everyone. Or kill the captain, Aote replied. Aode, you're right, Henry told her, saying so. But we both know you're perfectly qualified to command a battlecruiser of your own. If something happens to me, you can take over, and Raven isn't going to win this on her own. If we can get a clean shot of the car uh, and one of the Ghost Guardians, it might be worth it, he allowed. But it's still a terrible idea, O'Flanagan, and we have a lot of other arrows in our quiver first. I'm not planning on taking us all right now, sir, she said. I just want to make it clear that when we go out, you go with us, so that we don't get argue about it while there's a Guardian in weapons range. Henry knew he shouldn't do it. It was a terrible idea, one that risked Raven's commander, and yet, O'Flanagan was right. Six fighters were more likely to succeed in an attack on a Guardian than five. It could make the difference between a suicide run to buy Raven time and an actual kill that changed the tone of the entire situation. And he wanted to kill those bastards. He'd never been so angry, so determined to exact a blood toll on the people who killed his friends and two women he loved in his entire life. It might be wrong, but it might be right too. Either way, he was going to do it. You're right, XA, he repeated, but so are you, Commander. He looked down at the flight suit. You have the con for the moment, I okay, he told his XO. I'll be in the loop, but I'm going to go suit up. I'll authorize the missiles to six lancers. That still leaves Ravens with a full salvo in the launchers, and Song is to start fabricating new missiles ASAP. She's authorized to draw our material stock piles all the way down. It's dangerous, I said after a moment, but it might be worth it. Whatever happens, I guarantee you the drifters are not going to see it coming. This is a good book. 
This is a really good book, and it's a really good series. Now well, let's see, get back to the questions. Hmm. And military is great. Rank and name tag. First and last name. I know it is good. Jane Peter, bartender here. We always talk about customers in terms of what they drink, like tenants on a lager guy, a jagger guy, or sigeki and nuts were on. Hmm. I wonder what you would call. Uh, yeah, I have. No. King's Rock. Cranial implants are terrible idea. It's easy to hack electronics that get left on a factory settings. Cybernetics would be left on factory settings. Hacking stuff connected to the brain? Nope. Hmm. That room. I now have visions of a bio cyborg enhanced British Army so infantry. Or it involves a little igniter for setting fire to flatulence automatically. Brilliant. <laughs> <sighs> I call it risk called everyone professor. It works. In America, not in the UK. We're all doctor. There are a few professors, but they're the senior ones, so you look after Basically, if we're over a certain age, go for professor. Peacekeepers aren't all that easy to... Uh, pacemakers aren't all that easy to hack. Read from, reprogram the source. So, yes, turn off. No, you do that by sticking a magnet on it. Hmm. Let me see more. Three thousand, three hundred and seventy-four thousand kilometers on my car currently. <whistles> well, I could say Subaru or Volvo, but there's also Toyota in there. Mm-hmm. Peter, lol, someone did try to tell Kirk he shouldn't go away on a ship once. He punched them, then ran around the ship for an hour, screaming about how it's my ship. That means he shouldn't leave it. <laughs> Actually, that was a guy. Shatner, he wasn't in character at the time. Yeah, I like Shatner, he's quite funny. He's a good comedian actor when he wants to be. How much are you going to miss without reading the first two books? Read the first two books. But there is a reason why one of these books has turned up in pretty much every single one of these videos so far. We're on the third one, hence we're on the third book. <laughs> Staff Johnson de Clark had the same reaction. <laughs> uh, the first two books are worth reading and I have to say I'm looking forward to the fourth book I think if it follows Glenn Stewart's usual pattern it's usually six to nine books in a series and I have a feeling this will be quite like this will be a good series Nah, not another podcast I've listened to. Could do with me and Drag do, which is we listen to podcasts when we're driving. Although I'm I'm told that's antisocial sometimes when you have other people in the car. I don't know what you're talking about. Toyota Avalon, yeah. There are three makes where the cars last for freaking ever. Um Honda sometimes do it, it depends on the type of Honda. But 
Subaru, Volvo, and Toyota. Tom Gordon, have you read any of the Warhammer 30k, 40k books that deal with swarm? Yes, I have a few of them. They're pretty good. And some of the sci and some of the Star Trek ones and some of the Star Wars ones as well. I just don't do them because there are honestly whole channels which are devoted to them. And as much as I love them, there are whole channels devoted to them. And I think in the nicest way they will do the work on those books. Whereas <sighs> I was looking around for a YouTube video which featured Raven's course and the uh, the PC vs. Soul, and I couldn't find one when I was looking. I might have missed it. I didn't look. I have to admit, I only looked through the first three or four um, pages, so I could have the what turned on my in, and when I search it. And that, you always remember with YouTube, it does seem to adjust the search to your own logarithm. So, mm. but it's good. It's a good book. It's a good series. Darren, what do you think I do on my drive to or from work? Hmm. Not all. If anyone else gets serious, if that is serious, comes from it. Yes, especially if I don't, if they're authors who do not finish off the series well. And by finish off the series well, I mean I want an idea of what the people are doing afterwards. I don't need to know their full life story. I'd just like to know if they're settled down, if they're happy, what they're doing, basically. I like to have a sense of completion at the end of a series because you invest a lot in the series. You might, of course, you know, think about it. There are some series I'm going to, I've been talking about. Um, let's consider the Avalon one, the Carrie Avalon one. They cost about five, they cost about five pounds a copy of the ebook. And they're lovely. But that means you are thinking uh, you know you, you you're quite invested in that series once you get to the end you spent you invested time you invested money reading it and you know, money and time reading it and if they pick up the ending then it's really really annoying Ah, there they are. Right. Back in a second. I have to grab chocolates. I'm hungry. Now these were birthday present from someone who's very, very kind. I thought I had them closer. Considering all the other stuff I've been touching today, and since I last washed my hands, I'm just about to touch food. Yeah. 
Nein. Oh, Parking. Agreed, Dr. Clark. That's nice, not wolf. Um, uh, UK professor is highest grade of university lecturer. I was just used to title doctor or mister, depending on their degree. Using PhD, but I know a DPhil. She got a degree from Oxford. Yeah, degrees from Oxford, which are DPhils, are interesting ones. Mm hmm. Now, I have said thank you very much to the very nice people who sent this to me. Send this to me, but thank you again if you're watching. Uh, Mm-hmm. The well-known trick of using a ratcheted screwdriver as the opening tool on a box of chocolates. Not gonna work. All right, then. I'm gonna flash something which is gonna really annoy the lovely people at YouTube for a second. Uh, if I can spot it. If I can't spot it. No. Can't spot it. I'm gonna have to use... Screwdriver. Hey, crumba. <laughs> Getting into chocolates is always more difficult than looks. Right, let's see. I guess not so much of a parking lot if he was doing 250 30 kilometers per hour. Mm, if you're doing 250 30 kilometers in a, uh, an hour in a parking lot, it's a big parking lot. There are a few parking lots I think you can probably get up to that in. Oh. Chocolates. Melt. Mm hmm. Oh. Okay, so it's a box within a box. That's lovely. Chocolate boxes. Oh, they're chocolate brownies, individually wrapped. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. I hope they are still watching. Thank you. Professors have a chair of specific posts, while everyone's a lecturer of some kind. Uh, yes and no. Some professors do our chairs as well, but some professors are professors, and not always head the department or always not always professors. Some people are professors because they have produce a lot of in a lot of resource revenue for the university, and they're going research, and therefore you make them professor even if you don't have a chair. There are a few authors who died before, unfortunately, before they finished their series. <laughs> the fact that, um, yeah. The thing is, we're not really that secret about where we live, in the case of me and Drake. We just don't advertise it massively. Very nice. So. Next person I'm going to talk about.
Is this gentleman? Now, I'm sure, what I've done. I've got, I've got a mouthful of brownie and talk, trying to be talking seriously. Now, this is Raymond L. Wheel. Now, he's a very nice gentleman. Well, he was a very nice gentleman. Unfortunately, he's died. And he's the author of several books I've got lined up for the soon because he's died. And he's produced a huge range of books. And they really are quite cool. Now, on the most recent published one, book, uh, book, there is this dedication. This dedica book is dedicated first and foremost to my mum, Deborah. She encouraged my dad to follow his dream of writing and supported him throughout his writing career. She was an inspiration and comfort in times of struggles and hardship. They enjoyed 46 years of marriage. To my dad's sister, Diana, who he could joke around with and who allowed my dad to be his ornery self. They shared a love of cooking, which I believe came across in numerous books and detailed the food. Uh, to Aunt Bobby and Uncle George, who were like parents to my dad. Um, thank you for supporting and taking care of both of my parents uh, throughout their health struggles. You are truly appreciated. I know dad always enjoyed your presence and nurturing manner. To my brother Chris, who shared a love of farming and soccer with our dad. I'm glad he had someone to pass on all his farming wisdom to. To Peyton, his oldest granddaughter, who cherished from the moment she was born, or who he cher cherished from the moment she was born. He was so proud of you for working hard in pursuit of your career goals. He enjoyed many years of watching you play soccer and your dad tried to coach you. To Lexi, who he loved watching out on a far on the farm, spending countless hours riding and training your barrel racing horses. He was so proud that you were so determined and, uh, and persevered through everything to follow your passion of barrel racing. He always did have pointers for you on how you could do get better, but deep down knew that you probably knew more about than he did about the subject. To my son Brandon, who shared a love of camping and fishing with his grandpa, he also loved hearing grandpa's campfire stories. He always insisted we tell stories around the campfire, but no one holds a candle to the stories grandpa could tell. To Jacob, who I believe inherited his orneriness from his grandpa, as well as his creative imagination. Grandpa loved hearing all the, stor all the stories I could tell him of how ornery you are and the things you say. To Victoria, who always had an ongoing game of tag with grandpa, he really loved all the time he was able to spend with you and being able to pick you up from school. To Beckham, who will carry on the family name. He was so excited to watch Chris play for his ra uh, for his ra uh, to watch Chris pay for his raising. I'm sure he will all get. We will all get some good laughs at the in the future watching you grow up. Hopefully, you'll take after your grandpa a lot, especially in orneriness. As for myself, I think I inherited my dad's imagination, although I don't hold a candle to him. The treasured friendships of Dusty, Dana, Judy, and Bud. I'm glad you guys were able to have the special friendships that you guys all have all had these years. The friends that Chris and I grew up with, who throughout different parts of our lives were like kids to to my dad. He really valued you guys more than you can know. Ray, thank you for all you did for my dad. I think he sincerely appreciated it. To all the kids my dad ever coached in soccer, he really had a passion for the game and for coaching. Thank you for allowing him to pursue that passion. Lastly, I would like to thank all the fans who really allowed his dream of becoming an author to come true. Through you and his books, he is remember his memory and imagination will live on. Raymond Elwell, 1953 to 2020. Um, I didn't realize he died last year. I honestly didn't. But that was the dedication in the in the most recent publication, The Forgotten Empire of War for Empire, which we're getting into a bit. But, you know, this is what, ha uh, these are some of the, the things that happen, is your authors do go. But this, this gentleman has produced a huge number of books. Hello, Martini Henry. That's what, that looks like someone's mic drop. Yeah. But a really nice guy. <laughs> B. 
Pete Dawson, what time are you starting this week? GMT or British Summertime? Probably British Summertime. If you're interested in sci-fi, you will probably come across Raymond's books. I know I have a lot of them. I like them because they have a sense of humor in them. And they take the joke out of themselves. In many ways, as I said, it's very similar style to an extent to Terry Pratchett. Not Terry Pratchett, because no one's Terry Pratchett. There is a reason he's the individual he is. But I would say if there's a Terry Pratchett of the sci-fi genre who's able to take a joke about himself and build a huge world in which his stuff exists in, it's Raymond. And sadly, I'm gone. Come on. And this is one of his books, Earthfall to the Stars. One of many books. It's a very cool one to read, actually. Mm hmm. I'm not hearing the same as Ian Banks and that. Yes. It's a good, and these are good books. And as I said, I will. I wanted to read out the dedication because when I found out, read the book and went, oh, he's died. Oh. A, I hadn't realized. I'd just been happily ordering the books and working through them over the years and sort of hadn't realized he died last year. But also, I was sort of going, that's kind of sad, because usually his books follow a certain pattern. And he's currently got a series which is at its fourth book. And you can imagine there was going to be a sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth book. And now there's no, only going to be five books. So where it ends in five... <clears throat> it's where it's going to be. But I can guarantee I will still read the fifth book. Now, Earthfall to the Stars is part of a free book series currently. Um, which has Invasion to the Stars and Empires at War. Um, there are other parts in the coming, I think, somewhere, um, which have yet to be turned into Kindle books. And I have most of my sci-fi on Kindle. But when they are, I look forward to reading them. Yeah, Dev Squad. Amtrak is good on the East Coast because they own the rails. But elsewhere, they use freight tracks, which are bad and they're the lowest priority. Yeah. That's true. Knowing when you have that happened. That's why the UK system is kind of interesting, because there's the um, network rail, which owns all the railways. So they get to decide what the priorities of the operators are. Network rail runs at a sort of loss the whole time. It's the way, way the government subsidizes the railways.
Six days later, Trexillian Battle Commander Traven was pleased with the progress being made. A huge hole had been made in Earth's defenses over China and Russia. An additional 110,000 Trexillian soldiers had landed, were now sweeping through the two countries, seizing control of the outlining areas away from any human military bases. We've destroyed 22 cities protected by energy shields, reported Second Officer Ballon. Our ground troops are still locating and destroying the human energy, humans' energy cannons. In another week, our fleet will be safe from energy weapons fire, except from the four, their four space ports. We'll save the space ports until last, said Traven. He didn't want to risk heavy losses until the result of the, plant was pass the rest of the plant was pacified. He would send status updates to the High Command later in the day, and he would mention how destroying the last of the humans on the planet was proceeding as planned. Unfortunately, the use of so many fusion weapons would put the planet into a nuclear winter for a number of years. Hakan would not be pleased with that, but it was necessary. He was about to mention his colonized Asian plans to second officer Balan when an alarm sounded on the sensor console. He looked at it puzzled. That particular alarm indicated ships dropping out from hyperspace, and no Trexillian ships were scheduled for arrival. The Fury and the other ships with her dropping from hyperspace just outside the orbit of the moon. Moments later, Vengeance exited vault of fault space. Report ordered Captain Dolan as the view screens showed the stars as it was ex Earth and its moons. Trexillian battlecruisers and a troop ships in orbit around the planet. Mark's uh, reported Katana. Mark's eyes widened in concern at hearing this. Had they returned too late? Why is the atmosphere that color? Asked Marissa. An ugly brown and ash color hid the normal blue and white colors of the planet. Lisa quickly scanned the planet, her face pale. The Trexillians have used some of their fusion weapons. I'm detecting at least 22 impact points where there were once small cities. The planet's going into nuclear winter. Did we get back too late? Asked Brett. His gaze was glued to the whiskey rooms. Had the Traxillians already destroyed everything? Marissa, can you see if you can raise General Mitchell on the comm? Order Mark with a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. Alarms sounded in General Mitchell's command center as the six new red fret icons blossomed on the tactical display. Then surprisingly, one of the icons turned green. What are those? demanded General Mitchell. R R R R R it's the vengeance, replied Colonel Fields with a huge grin. And she isn't alone. General, I have Mar uh, Marissa on, from the battleship Fury asking to talk to you. She says the ship is under the command of Captain Dolan. Colonel Field shook his head in confusion. I don't have any records of Marissa on the constellation uh, of the Vengeance. Her accent is strange as well, uh, uh, added Colonel Stewart. It reminds me of a cat's purr. <laughs> Mitchell looked at the tactical display. How large are those five ships of the Vengeance, and where is the constellation? Those five ships are 2,200 meters in length, reported Colonel Fields, with excitement slipping into his voice. Mitchell wondered what had happened to the two ships on their journey of exploration. Put me through to Captain Dolan, and why isn't Captain Erickson contacting us? Something bad must have occurred out there, said General Briggs, as he gazed at the tactical display. Everyone looked expectantly at Cat General Mitchell, waiting, and waiting for him to speak to Captain Dolan. Was this the salvation Earth was seeking? On Trexillian Battle Commander Traven's flagship, the sensor officer reported, We have six ships just exiting hyperspace near the Earth's moon. One of the ships is one of the human's small battlecruisers, and the other five have been identified as Voltrex battleships. Battle Commander Traven's eyes widened in alarm, and uh, hearing this, What are Voltrex ships doing here? It's greatly concerned him, as the Voltrex were supposedly contained in the their region of space. What had changed? Battle Commander Balfour reported destroying a human ship near Voltrex space, and a second human ship was rescued by Voltrex forces and taken to one of the colony worlds, answered Second Officer Ballon. This has to be the vessel. Traven recalled the report, now that Ballon mentioned it. Scan those Voltrex ships! I want to know what their power readings are! He had a suspicion, which he hoped was not true. Battle Commander Balfour was supposed to take care of the Voltrex colony world where the human ship had been taken refuge. They're off the scale, reported Colder a few minutes later. All five ships have definitely been updated with Gelnoid technology. I've never de detected power readings like these before. A queasiness circled through Trevon. Ships of that size with Gelnoid tech weapons and energy shields might be unstoppable. He looked at a view screen of the planet he had been nuking for the spot last week. If the humans had succeeded in unleashing Gelnoid technology into the galaxy, the Trexillian Empire could be in real danger. The humans could would seek their revenge for what the Empire had done to their world. Pull all our ships in close. He ordered, have the troop ships mo move into the pr uh, center of our formation. All ships prepare for combat. General Mitchell listened to the Captain Dolan explain what had happened on the exploration mission and how the constellation had been destroyed and the Vengeance heavily damaged. Captain Erickson was still in charge of the Vengeance, but due to his severe injury, he felt it prudent that Captain Dolan command the fleet. He also explained why there was a change in his rank. How apparently are these vault treks? asked General Mitchell. <laughs> In response, the main view screen suddenly changed to show a few of the command center of the Fury. A number of the cat people of the same stature as humans were clearly visible. They all wore a basic military uniform with different colors. One, a female with a more decorated uniform, stood next to Captain Dolan. Very friendly, she said. I'm Lieutenant Commander Lelef. 
and will be representing the Voltrex while we're here. I look forward to many years of working with your people. I believe you will find we have multiple things in common. For a moment, General Mitchell was unsure how to respond. Speaking to another species had not been in his plans for today. Sir, our scans indicate all five Voltrex battleships are equipped with Gelnoid technology, reported Colonel Fields. Mitchell looked inquiringly at the screen, knowing Captain Dolan and Lieutenant Commander Lelef would see him as well. Captain Dolan hesitated and then answered, Acting under the authority Captain Erickson gave me, and with his approval, we entered into an agreement with Voltrex. We offered to provide them unrestricted access to Gelnoid technology, and they in turn will build us a fleet to protect Earth. This is something you can discuss with the President and other world leaders later. Sorry about that. Um, considering the situation we now find ourselves in, I vote to approve this agreement based on necessity of our survival. Now, for an important question. Can those five Voltrex battleships do anything to remove the Telexian infestation from our orbital battle space? Dolan grinned. We have five Voltrex battleships, all much larger than the Telexian battlecruiser. All five ships have Gelnoid weapons and shields. I don't believe the Trexillians will enjoy what we're about to do to them. I'll leave, uh, General Mitchell and Ode, I'll leave the specific sub to you. General Mitchell out. Professor Wilkins was right, said Major Thomas Grimm. They did find help and were able to bring them back. General Mitchell smiled for the first time in days. Let's see how they do against the Trexillians. If they succeed in driving them away from Earth, then it will change the entire situation. Contact all four spaceports. If the Traxilians are driven from Earth orbit, I want all our ships launched. General Mitchell returned to his gaze to the view screens and tactical display. He was anxious to observe the coming battle. President Halfway was in her office with Professor Wilkins and Major Cunningham. She had just been told about new arrivals, and she could see the ecstatic look on Professor Wilkins' face. He had been right, and proof was near the moon. I should have listened to you, said Caitlin, thinking about the two lost colony ships and the four battle cruisers that have been destroyed. All those young people would still be alive. That's in the past, said Major Cunningham. We shouldn't second-guess ourselves. You did what you thought was right at the time. Caitlin pursed her lips and so you nodded. She'd always feel guilty about the colony fleet. It had been a mistake and a costly one. How strong do you think those five ships are? Professor Wilkins grinned. They wouldn't have come back unless they're ready to send the Trexillians to oblivion. I suggest we sit back and listen to the show. Professor Wilkins was thrilled the vengeance was there here. He had a thousand questions for Lisa. He was greatly saddened to hear about the loss of the Constellation's crew. He would not let Lisa leave again. He wanted to keep her here at the Complex One, where she would be safe and could help in his research. He strongly suspected she would not object. On the Fury, Mark leaned back in his command chair. Take us in, he ordered. Form up in a diamond formation. The Fury and Vengeance will be stacked to posi in uh, position in the center. Fred adjusted the small fleet's speed to accelerate towards the Trexillian ships, which were rapidly changing their fleet formation. Trexillians seem unsure of themselves, reported Clay. They're putting their troop ships in the center of their formation. For protection, said Lieutenant Kamala Laff. It is good to see them fear us for once. She stretched out her right hand, her claws extending from her fingertips. She licked her claws, imagining the taste of Trexillian blood. Then embarrassed, she retracted them. I'm sorry for my display of anger. The Trexillians have killed many of my people, and would have killed more if not for your arrival. No offence taken, Mark replied. I believe we all feel the same about the lizard people. Look at what they have done to my world. We're nearly in missile range, reported Katana. Mark looks in and Carter. Fire missiles when we reach engagement range. Ours fire range any weapons the Trexillians possess. Let's make use of them. Keep reserve of 40% in case we need some later. 40 seconds to missile range, reported Chloe. Trexillians are still attempting to get their ships into a defensive formation. I believe they are uncertain about the offensive capabilities of our ships. Mark nodded. Well, they're about to find out. Mark took a deep breath. It's time to see in these Trexillians to hell. The six ships neared an engagement range and then reached it. 70 of the 40 megaton fusion missiles ex exited the missile tubes, and scant moments later, another 70 left. All 140 missiles hurtled towards the, sh uh, the sh thing ships in the Traxillian fleet. Inbound missiles, warned Calder as the moral alarm sounded. They're gelnoid, and we can barely lock on. Defensive turrets fire, ordered Battle Commander Traven, feeling frantic. It was taking his fleet longer than he wanted to get into its defensive formation. Some ships were in the way of others, blocking their weapons fire. He gazed anxiously at the tactical display, revealing the inbound missiles. They seemed to flicker in and out of existence as the sensors had a hard time locking onto them. From the Trexillian battlecruisers and troopships, defensive energy beam turrets began firing. 
The space between the inbound missiles and the Trexillian fleet became full of energy beams. In space, missiles exploded as they were struck, leaving fiery fireballs to light up the darkness. Ten missiles, then twenty were destroyed. The remaining missiles drew nearer the Trexillian ships, and more died. Space was full of dying missiles, but many more still survived. In ones and twos, they struck the Trexillian ships. Two battlecruisers died as they were blown apart when their energy shields failed. Six troop ships were annihilated as missiles pe penetrated to the heart of the fleet. Other ships suffered heavy damage from the attack, but they were still operational. The five Volterix battleships and the Vengeance continued to close the range. Suddenly, energy being fire erupted from the battleships, tearing into the Trexillian fleet. Two more missile bar uh, barrages were launched from the closer range, making it more difficult for the Trexillian's offensive energy beams to turrets to lock on. The Trexillian fleet was encompassed in a bright light from the exploding ships and the uncontrolled energy released from dozens of 40 megaton fusion missiles. Trexillians had never encountered fire force, uh, fire force such as the five Voltrex battleships possessed. Powerful energy beams drilled right through the Trexillian energy screams, ripping open battlecruisers, leaving them drifting in space to be destroyed by the fusion missiles. Trexillians returned fire with every beam and missile they had, all were useless as the powerful energy screams around the battlecruisers simply shrugged off the attacks. Even the Vengeance, with its new and improved fusion reactors, found its energy screen able to resist the attack of the Trexillians. In the Trexillian fleet, energy beam fired from one of the Voltrex battleships slammed into the main part of a Trexillian battlecruiser, setting off a massive explosions and hurling glowing debris into space. Emergency bulkheads slammed shut as the ship shook violently. Secondary explosions spread throughout the ship blowing out huge sections of the hull, a final massive explosion, and the ship disintegrated. Mark felt the fury shake from multiple impacts of Trexillian missiles. With concern, he looked at a view screen focused on the vengeance. A screen was lit up from the constant release of fusion energy. A shield will hold, said Chloe. The new fusion reactors are working as Lisa and Brenda predicted. I don't believe the Trexillians, with the ships they have there here, can break through the shields. I confirm that, said Lieutenant Kamalavayev. Our energy shield has never dropped below 87%. Move us closer, ordered Mark, wanting to inflict as much damage as possible on the Trexillian fleet. It's time we teach those Trexillians a lesson. Mark was determined to destroy as much of the Trexillian fleet as possible. One thing he'd already noticed, all six of the battle stations that were supposed to help protect Earth were gone, as well as the entire defense grid. It was hard telling how many more of Earth's inhabitants had died in the f uh, fusion explosions, which had destroyed 22 more of Earth's cities. He would show no mercy to the orbiting warships. Trexinian battle commander Tavern held onto his command chair as flagship shook violently. Around him his fleet was dying. Ship after ship was being blown apart by the deadly energy beams from the Voltex ships. The fusion missiles the enemy ships launched only added to the carnage. We cannot win, said Second Officer Ballon, as he was nearly knocked to the deck from the violent shaking of the ship. These shields are impossible to bring down. We've hit them with everything we have, and they don't even waver. On one of the view screens, a Trelexian battlecruiser was cut in two by a heavy energy fire from the Voltrex fleet. Moments later, both sections were vaporized by two fusion missiles. Tram was shaken by the firepower he was witnessing. What would this mean for the Empire? We've lost 87 battlecruisers and 43 troop ships, said Second Officer uh, Balan, uh, reported in a stunned voice. Battle Commander Traven wondered if this was how Battle Commander Balfour felt when the humans forced him to withdraw from this world. Order all ships to jump in hyperspace and rendezvous outside the orbit of the fourth planet. From there, we'll leave the system and make our report to High Command. Even as the ship shook violently once more, he looked at one of the few screens of Earth. He was leaving over 200,000 Trexillian troops behind. No doubt, with the human orbit uh, humans once more in control of the orbitals, space above their world, those troops would shortly be annihilated. With a deep sigh, he realized he was no better than Battle Commander Balfour. Both had left hundreds of thousands of Trexillian soldiers to die on this world. Jumping, reported Second Officer Balan as it made its transition in our space and safety. Battle Commander Traven leaned back in his command chair. There was a little doubt in his mind that this time, his military career was over. In his quarters was a vial containing poison. Ron returned home in disgrace and suffered emotion and assignment to some menial task. He would drink the liquid in the vial and end his life. His time as battle commander of Empire was o of the Empire was over. That's a good book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Hmm. Britain. Basically, Britain's roads have been renationalized. Even after privatization, the government had made most of the decision of the contracting of the franchises of the trail operating on it. Uh, yes and no. And not quite Derp Squad. Um, I wouldn't say the risk is publicly owned. I'd say the, go the government, they have to step in if it defaults. So, but there's no real option not to if the railway, if they default. But they do find a way of getting the money back, trust me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, Dan Freeman, and amusing the British trains, one of the main suppliers of trains is Canadian firm Bombardier. Yeah, it works. Jamie Lennon, I'm sure I got a train only a year ago or two ago and be able to still send it on the, sl uh, the slidey down windows. I, I doubt that, but there's always a possibility. Depends where you are in the country. And you, in, in the southeast, they tend to try and change all the colours within like five minutes. Hence GWR returning. Hmm. <laughs> mm. Is this one of the books that continues out to a full 8 to 10 book series mentioned? It's three books in this series that are on Kindle. I think there's another couple which might not be on Kindle, but it's very good. Uh, stuff sounds like mainly because, honestly, military are now focused on coming home alive. And that actually makes it better. And the odds are we will not. Okay, I never want to say this about the British because there is always a possibility that we suddenly decide to remember to do it again. But um, as a rule, we no longer hang officers. You might as well come home and live. The cover art is very good. <laughs> Um, Jim Peter, Jim Peter, well, actually, IKB got Broad Gauge, the trouble is... Fitting Broad Gauge was more expensive than Standard Gauge. And IKB, as good as he was as a salesman, wasn't as good as George Stevenson was. And George Stevenson was the guy who was, who was pushing Standard Gauge because it was cheaper to put in and it was a lot easier. Vision. Um, British Rail was one of the best run government railways in the world, and why Thatcher left it alone for the most part. She did electrification of the East Coast Mainline. Honestly, yes and no, but she planned, if she were, she'd said that a report actually won the Thatcher government, which was if you're going to do privatization, you need to go to full hog and allow A, the train companies to build more lines if they want to build them. And B, you have to basically have the control. Everyone has to take on the risk and the reward. They, you have to put properly privatize them, not set up the weird franchisey system which we have. Mm, we, we found better ways of torturing our animals now. We send them on 
television interviews. <laughs> you want to see a Royal Navy Admiral squirm, you put him in front of, I don't know, Andrew McNeil. AI Anuk, AI KB, England is in Bard, King of Brunel. And yes, I do agree, Brawler Gains would have been better, but we've built them on Standard Gauge. And you can still get them up to roughly 200 plus. Which, just as I said, I've noticed that Vision has said the same thing. Hmm. Right. Next book. <laughs> And Right then, let's put in this next, because I think this, oh, we'll do that one last. So we'll just do this one next, which is conflict unending. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Probably just easier. Mirren, <sighs> Japan did it right. Vertically integrated regional railways with public support for lines in rural areas. Some railways are private, some others are public enterprises. Yeah, Japan had fun help. You know, J Japan has reasons for it, how it's set up like it is, and they've done quite well. I'm gonna. Is it okay, Dr. Clark? I might ping you a message on Discord about re entering the world of academia. Yeah, more than welcome to. And yes, but you have to remember the issue with HS2, and um, this is one of the things is it, you, you have to remember what HS2 is being built to do. It's basically rebuilding the Central Express line, which we used to have, but we don't have it now. So you have no place to put the, uh, put the traffic when you want to do upgrades on the East Coast or the West Coast Main Line. So we need to do upgrades on the East Coast and West Coast Main Line. We can't transfer all the traffic from one of those main lines onto the other main line because there is enough space in it. So the whole reason for building HS2 is to take the passenger traffic off one of the, off those main lines alternately. So you only have to move the freight onto one of those main lines because most of that travels later at night and you can do it more you can do it slightly more pushy and then you can upgrade those main lines it's 
it's the joys of life. It's if you're a, diff a small enough island and things are in enough complications, um, welcome to the world you live in. You only have limited resources. So this is the Originator Walls, which is a whole series and series and series. Honestly, it's... Okay, there's six bo books in this series. But there's a series which precedes it, which is another six books, and there's a series which I think um, before that, which is also another six books. So there's about 18 books in this series. If you want to get into this world, there is world building on upon world building upon world building. It's really, really cool. And the thing is, by the time you've read it all the way through, you'll want to go back and start again, because there'll be things you'll be going, well, where did that come in? I didn't even realize that came in. And then you just start again. And you sort of go, cool. <laughs> King's Rook. My mom's making points for us to get tested as I type. <whistles> COVID. Sorry to hear that. Some God, they're actually building a lot of East-West lines. This is the thing. HS2 gets all the talk about because that's the really expensive one. Because guess what? You're building it through central London. You're building it through the center of various cities. It's very expensive to buy and build. But there is a lot of work going on up to the East-West lines as well. King's Rook, hope you'll be okay. <laughs> Discord. The issue is HS2 will actually increase traffic through the bottlenecks and then road around Houston, Birmingham, Manchester, and they're going to lay in more lines while doing it and smooth out the sync uh, the the points and signaling. Some of the stuff which HS2 is going to do is uh, people looking at going, they're building sidings and runarounds and all sorts of things, and you're sort of going, why? Because it it will increase the throughput of trains. Alice shifted her attention to Kevin. In five years, we can have the shields and the fleet bases building nearly 800,000 ships per year. To go beyond that, we would have to add more fleet bases and expand mining operations into thousands of additional star systems. Civilizations in galaxies where there are shields would quickly become aware of us, something we've been trying to avoid as knowledge of uh, knowledge, a race such as the originators exists, could have devastating effects. Not as bad as what will happen if the Eternals conquer those civilizations, Jeremy said. Whether we like it or not, at some point we're going to need more allies. The 600 galaxies in the originated controlled space and some of the more advanced civilizations they contain may have to become involved in the war. The originators won't like that, replied Alice, but I understand your reasoning. When the numbers they have, is there any point in attacking their galaxies? For every ship we destroy, they'll just, be, they'll just build two more. By attacking Eternal Galaxies and destroying those shipyards, we are forcing them to keep major fleets in those galaxies to protect them, fleets which could be attacking us. But what if they decide to strip their fleets from those galaxies and attack us anyway? asked Commander Malin. They could overwhelm the fleet base and isolate the Dyson Fears in just a few months. Or only from the rest of the galaxy, each shield is within, um, replied Angus. We would still have the intergalactic vortexes built into each uh, built into each shield, as well as the new accelerator rings. While the shields might be cut off from their galaxies, they would not be cut off from each other. Jeremy leaned back in his command chair on a view screen, and Malanka was leading his fleet against Admiral Cross, trying to force Cross to retreat from a large asteroid he was defending. Screens lit up with simulated weapons fire. There are a number of originators who believe the Eternals will attack us in a force, even if it meant uh, means leaving the galaxies their, their galaxies nearly defenseless. Dazon Fells is almost certain the Eternals will launch a major attack. Dazon is correct, said Ares, putting her hands on her hips. The Eternals cannot tolerate the confirmed existence of the originators. We pose too big a threat to them. They will risk everything to destroy us. We need the blue energy spheres, said Commander Malon, crossing her arms over the chest. We could defeat the Eternals with those. Alanis shook her head. The weapons are too dangerous. 
The science behind the development was nearly banned by the originators soon after its discovery. Fleets armed with blue energy spheres could destroy entire galaxies. The weapon must never fall into anyone else's hands. That's why it's limited to Shields, new battle stations, Dominator, and Kelsey's new Explorator Super Exploration Dreadnought. Jeremy stood up and walked over close to the, uh, closer to the view screen. Admiral Cross had turned the tables on Admiral Lankel and was inflicting heavy losses on the Alton Admiral's fleet. Lankel had performed reasonably well in the scenario, but Admiral Cross had used a little bit of trickery to lure Lankel into a trap. Valius mentioning the new battle stations, an idea of how they could be used against the Eternals came to mind. It was something he would have had to ask some of the original, uh, science, original the originator scientists uh, about when he got back to the hub. With all the new weapons being installed on the Dyson Spheres, they should be safe from any size attack by the Eternals. However, what about the two Vortex control centers, the Simulants control? How big a threat are those? We're preparing to deal with that threat. In another two weeks, we'll attack both of the Vortex control centers and attempt to wrest control of them back from Simulants. Fleets are being prepared for those two actions, and large numbers of combat robots are being built and programmed. We're also expecting another 20,000 Marines from the Federation to arrive in the next week. They'll free up enough Marines currently on duty at the hub to handle the ground attack. General Reyes Wellesley already has a new training schedule for the new Marines. He believes he can have them ready for deployment in two weeks after they arrive. Commander Malin shifted her attention to a view screen, showing Admiral Lank Lankel's fleet in full retreat. He's doing a pretty good job holding his losses to a minimum. I spoke to Rear Admiral Marks of the Fleet Academy just before he left. She set up a training schedule for the new recruits coming in from the Federation. There is a large group of humans, Altons, Originators, and Originator AIs who will be doing the instruction. It's a six-week training schedule to prepare Federation personnel to command our new warships. Jeremy grinned. I think Susan was shocked when I laid the job on her. She's doing a fabulous job with the new Fleet Academy. She's also thrilled so many new Federation citizens will be transferring to the Dyson Sphere. We'll give her a wide range of recruits to choose from. In another six to eight weeks, we'll begin to see a massive increase in the crews we have available for our dreadnoughts and to help out at fleet bases. Rear Admiral Mann believes our combat efficiency at the fleet bases could be increased substantially if there are humans and Alton in the command crew. Admiral, we've had an emergency message from Meklin and Dyson Sphere, reported Lieutenant Shillelance. Meklin was a military AI in command of Dyson Defense's Dyson Sphere in Galaxy X938. He just received word from the hub that the Eternals have launched the new attacks against fleet bases in originator space. Reports indicate at least 10 fleets of 10,000 Eternal battlecruisers are involved. That's 100,000 ships, uh, warships, gas, Gavin. His eyes went in shock. Dazzle was right, said Jeremy, realizing the unanimity of the attack. The Eternals are going to attempt to destroy the fleet bases to isolate the Dyson spheres. Jeremy wasn't certain what to do. He could take more battlecruisers and dreadnoughts from the Dyson spheres and assign them to the fleet bases. There were over 500,000 battlecruisers which have been updated. The problem was where to send them. Spread out over 2,000 fleet bases, even if he used every battle cruiser available, that would still only be 250 ships at each one. Not enough to prevent the Eternals from attacking and destroying the bases, it would also strip the Dyson Spheres of ships they might need to defend themselves. Kevin looked over at Jeremy. What are we going to do? Contact Maiklin and have him initiate and form Admiral Kalin to initiate Operation Dragon. Jeremy had hoped this wouldn't be necessary. Ariel looked surprised. Are you sure it's wise? I don't see what else we can do. We have 2,000 fleet bases to defend. You'll subsequently weaken our dreadnoughts and delay their deployment. Only for a while. Jeremy replied, he was taking a risk, but it might buy us some time. What is Operation Dragon? Ask Commander Mallon, looking confused. Operation Dragon is a strategy Admiral Kalen and I came up with. We're going to strip all the defense globes from the dreadnoughts at the communication of the transport hub and send them to the fleet bases. We also have, a, also have a large number in reserve waiting for new dreadnoughts we built. We'll be using them as well. Initially, all fleet bases will receive 3,000 defense globes. In addition, the Dyson Spheres will be sending 100 battlecruisers and four dreadnoughts to help defend each fleet base. 100 battlecruisers and four dreadnoughts won't do a lot of good against fleets large as these, said Kevin, shaking his head. Aerial glance over at Command Mellon and then Kevin. This is a purely defensive strategy. With the extra warships and defense globes, the fleet bases will be harder to destroy. Many of the fleet bases have a new dark energy cannons and antimatter chambers installed. We've added more gravitonic cannons and antimatter projectors. Between the base's weapons and the defense globe, uh, globes and warships, we may just be able to make the Eternals hesitate in attacking them for fear of major losses to their fleet. It's a cool series.
Mm, they've got plans, Dirt Squad. I've been looking at it quite a lot over the years because I use those lines quite a lot. Hmm. Hmm. I sometimes think the reason the British um, programs seem to often cost so much more than their counterparts is because we're almost honest about where to, how much they're going to cost. Almost honest. Dyson Sphere would be an empire unto itself. That it could be. If you have lots of them, that's even more interesting. And last book for today. Ay, caramba. Still enough, that's the last of the iron brew I've gotten here tonight. So I better make sure it lasts. So, last book, War for the Empire. Now, this was, of course, the book I read the, uh, the example out of. Mm. And it's a good book. Here is the thing. The Great Council of the Confederation was once more in session. They gave a number of large youth themes. Oh, um, um, showing the shattered remains of the fleets that they had sent to attack Earth. Out of over 8,000 ships they had sent, only 2,237 had returned, many of them showing major damage. How could this have happened, demonic Lund, the Druin counselor? The fleet, that fleet should have rolled over the humans. Fleet Admiral Hrab, in his last message, stated the humans of Earth were far more dangerous than those in the Empire, <laughs> answered Morag Council Damara. Hrab believed, uh, believed it was uh, due to them having been uh, having a barbaric culture for many years m before making contact with some survivors from the human empire. <laughs> Harab claimed the humans of Earth will be the most ferocious warriors the Confederation has ever encountered. He warned that if they were not dealt with, they would become a far greater threat than even the hum new human empire. <laughs> Ridiculous, said Clun, raising to his feet. They are only one star system, and they are far away from us and the empire. Nevertheless, they have defeated all three of the fleets we have sent against them, the, him, the replied Demora, his large eyes focusing on Clun. I recommend we send a small fleet of warships to monitor the Earth system. We must stay abreast of what occurs there. While the human empire is a danger, I am more concerned about what Earth may do to our re do after our recent failed attack. Should we send a second fleet now to destroy the system, while it has been weakened by Admiral Harabe's fleets? Asked he Head of Councillor Arden Riel, a Lormelian. The Mora was silent for several long moments, and then he spoke chilling words. I've spoken to a number of Morag military analysis. We have analyzed in detail the scans that Admiral Harabe took of the Earth system. We estimate it would take, at a minimum, 20,000 warships to destroy it. 20,000? spoke the Zancast in shock. Of that 20,000, how many would we lose? 12 to 15,000, answered the Mora calmly. Many of the surviving ships will be damaged to some extent. What do we do? asked Klug, the Morphine representative, as his form flowed and shifted. We build up our fleets, but leave Earth alone for now, replied Demora. In time we'll be ready to deal with Earth, for now we must turn our attention to the growing threat within the Confederation from the Human Empire. 
I propose we repair Admiral Harabe's fleet and greatly reinforce it. We then send it to the human empire and we take all the worlds. Once we've dealt with their empire, then we can return our full attention to the, to the Earth humans, can decide that what we must do to deal with them. Arden Rule frowned. On one of the view screens, a heavily damaged Lomalian battleship was visible. It had several large holes in its side, with burn marks the length of its hull. Arden was surprised the ship had made it back. It will take us weeks to repair all the damage to our ships. While we're doing that, and then conquering the human empire within our confederation, what will Earth be doing? A small task group. We'll be monitoring that, uh, explained Namora. I want Earth kept under constant surveillance. We have another problem, Fleet Admiral Harvey uh, uh, faced, uh, uh, faced over 7,000 of the human small attack craft. We must have a way to deal with them. Arden Rule uh, reached forward and switched to one of the view screens to show a small, heavily armed light cruiser. This is a ship stored in our military archive, specifically designed to deal with small ships. After a few minor modifications, it should deal with the human's attack craft. The specs are in the archives on Bada Prime. We can modify several of our shipyards and produce these immediately. The Mora nodded. He saw how these vessels should, would be useful. They might be. Uh, might have uh, made a huge difference in the previous battle for Earth. Send a copy of the specs to all the member races of this council. Each should build sufficient numbers of these light cruisers to protect our larger warships. It will be done, Bri replied Arden. In the meantime, all members of the races of this council need to continue to build new warships. Our remote scouts indicate the core worlds of the human empire are now producing large numbers of warships. The same is true of the number of other worlds in the empire. Taking some of these worlds, particularly the core worlds, will be very difficult. Two weeks, said Demora. In the black of Kun's mind, Demora placed the mental command. In two weeks, we must send warships to the human empire to take those worlds for the confederation. We must commit at least another 5,000 warships to this endeavor. Dream Council suggested, nodded, and uh, nodded approvingly. I would suggest we start on the periphery of the human empire and work inwards. We take the weakest worlds first, and by doing so, reduce the resource available to the core worlds. In time, only the core worlds will stand against us. It will take time to conquer so many worlds, commented Relicon. The human core worlds will be easy, no easy victory. But they will fall, rep responded Clun. Let us repair our ships and make preparations for a full-scale attack on the human empire. All the council nodded in agreement. None knew that the Mora had placed the suggestions to repair the ships and for an all-out attack on the human empire into Clun's mind. It's a very interesting series, that. And it's his last series, apparently, because he wrote it and unfortunately didn't die. Now, if you don't mind, I'll be in here in a second, but a spider has managed to get past the fences of the property, and I intend to make sure it doesn't get saved here. Bye-bye. Thank you. There we go. <sighs> Hmm. Building the city centers is very expensive. You can say that again, Vision. <laughs> Nerd Caveman. Hello, Nerd Caveman. I don't think I've seen you for a while. I've seen you before. I've seen you for a while. Um, it reminds me of the Solarian League versus Manticore in Royal Navy now. now. Hmm. Vision. I wish this US, uh, the, uh, this USN had designs in its archives that with modifications could be produced immediately in the shipyards. Ah, oh, the dream. Uh, Man in 640, but the Solis have so many SDs, there's no way their RMN could take them on. Yeah.
Okay, why are wars versus humans always starting with the outer colonies and then working on small Earth? It's an interesting thing, but sometimes they do actually start with attacking Earth and work their way outwards. Um, Empire Rising has a good example of that. And sometimes they work the other way. In fact, in Empire Rising, two different things. The Russians work that way. And then the um, aliens, the arachnids, work that way. And I do love, you're going to have a bogeyman alien. Yeah, they're all giant spiders. Anyway, so I'm going, uh, it, it's kind of the science fiction version of Nazis. Excuse that, YouTube. But it is. We want to do a science fiction baddie that everyone's going to agree is bad. Beyond it. They're giant spiders. Ah! I don't care. Stomp them. <laughs> it's the joy of history and the joy of science fiction. Rigvasa, thank you. Good night, Dr. Lund. Thank you. Oh, it's a, this is a good book and it's a good series. And there is at least a fifth one that's coming out. I've seen they're cool books. Anyway, so I'm going to answer a few more questions. And basically, my plan is to get to roughly the four hour. Well, I'm over the four hour mark. So, roughly another. Well, until my voice starts going dry. Or let me see if I've got a. Uh, you're in luck. I have a can of, a can of iron brew left. I have a can of iron brew left. I need to buy some more cans. So. Q&A now. And answering general questions and things. Um, until the end. Um, no, so last full series or will it end a five book? Please tell me not to kill the spoiler. Uh, a spoiler. No, that was Raymond L. Wheels. Um, as I said, he's there. I know there's at least a fifth book coming. I don't know if there's going to be a sixth book. That was the fourth book. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be a sixth book. I, I, I just don't know. I hope the fifth. Uh, I, uh, he's died, and I know there is a fifth book coming because that's what's mentioned in the fourth book start, but. No one knows if there's going to be some uh, a sixth book. <laughs> At least I don't. Carmichael's with arachnid aliens. Do we have? And remember, these are giant arachnids. These are not just arachnids. They are giant arachnids, and they are ten foot tall spiders. <laughs> and, Spirit of Grins kill or I was less agreeable things. It's it's a good series to read though still. I highly recommend it. Oh four, oh five. Oh, oh. The thing is I don't know. So that's how many questions and answers we have because at that point my voice will start to dry up. Mmm. Jam Peter, thank you, Doctor. Another resident some stream. Well, I do realize the sci fi ones are a little bit more random, but I like to do them because I think it's important to sort of connect up the two and I get to talk about some things which. I can't talk, I can talk about, because it's part of my teaching strategies often that I do use sci-fi, because if I start talking about histo history sometimes, as examples of strategy, everyone's wedded. There's historical take, there's a cultural side, there's a good guy and a bad guy, and automatically they're good. In sci-fi, you can explain they're a good guy, that they aren't. Um, one of the things I like in Carrier Avalon, in, a, in the Avalon series that we started off this first episode, is that actually the characters sit there and think, well, we think we're the good, guy, uh, good people, but the Terrans, who are the, who want to unite everyone, all of Earth, as one, uh, one empire and one group, also think they're the good people, probably. They're not necessarily bad people, they think they're good people. We don't agree with them. And literally, the argument for the Terrans is, 
all humans should unite under us. And you sit there and go, well, are you going to try to do this by democracy? Because all these, uh, quite a lot of these powers who seem to be mind powers seem to be democracies. So, you know, could do a little bit of manipulation, a little bit of politics, you know, get them to elect governments or popular movements, which get it to the line. No, you're going to send in warships. And some of the warships are going to be commanded by people who go mad and decide to blow up whole planets. Do you not see how this might cause problems longer term? Take care, Tom Golding, and bees. Bees are also good. <laughs> it does cause sweet. Someone ordered an emergency dealer into Iron Brew to the last office. Uh, that's what super chats are for. They go usually go towards the next week's Iron Brew supply. <laughs> um. Not a wolf. Little bro said uh, the reason bees are so critically uh, critical now is that they are invasive and have killed off all the other pollinators. Not sure what to make of that. Have looked at it. Next on the list. Nah. Mm, that is part of the reason the bees are so critical. They are very good, but they haven't killed off all the other pollinators. Let's be honest. There are butterflies. There are lots of other pollinators out there which do pollinating. They just don't do pollinating as efficiently or as effectively or as single mindedly as bees. There are also lots of varieties of bees. Come on, some earlier brew ships. There was a book about naval warfare horrors. Collector of bones, a similar title. Help me. Um, I think I know what you mean. I will try and track it down. Jamek, because we are in the free ride area, any more thoughts on the Children of Dead Earth game? Really enjoying it, it's quite realistic space combat. Mmm, it is quite good on space combat. Tom John, the genre of fantasy naval fiction, rather than um, sci-fi, is really unexplored. I I'd love to build a world based around fantastic na fantastical naval combat. Uh, Douglas Riemann and... Uh, oh... My favorite is the Drink Water series, which uh, Richard Woodman do some great ones. I have done something like that. I might have to do another one of those coming up again soon, go back over some of those. <laughs> Thank you, Vision. Tom Thompson, would you and Drac be game to give it a go? Uh, I have to see what it is on Twitter. I've been avoiding Twitter today. I've been editing and sorting things out for various projects. So I've been avoiding Twitter and avoiding lots of other things. Oh, thank you. Oh. Not a wolf. Free spiders. I'm all right with them, but don't know that they're they're uh, they're there until they touch. Due to my oh, thank you, Dad Daniel. Um, <sighs> due to my, until they touch. Due to my vision, I try not to reflect it. Uh, reflect the jerk and throw them, but it's bad hard sometimes. They're good for us. I agree. Spiders are good for us. I just don't like them anywhere near my office. Uh, either the books or especially the radiator, because I have a feeling they'll get caught in the radiator and then I have charred spider to smell for a few weeks until it wears out. I don't want fancy smelling charred or the spider. Trouble is, there are a few holes, I think, in the floor and underneath the door, which I'm going to have to fill in and sort out. Angus, are we the baddies? I mean, we are giant spiders. Hmm. But to a giant spiders, are humans just more flies? R.C. Clark's novel Earth-like is the only novel with a military conflict at the centre of a story. In this case, a spy story on the moon. 
Good work. Hmm. Okay, Mass Effect. What if alien spiders were good, actually? <sighs> that would completely confuse people. Michael Truett, I like when multiple series are well written in the same universe and you multiply perspectives from factors. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we all like uh, we all like Terry Pratchett. Hmm. <laughs> fantasy naval combat. Oh, uh, there's been a few things like that. If you like the fantasy stuff, there is Warships Mage series, which I think is by Glyn Stewart. Glyn again. Um, what's his name? Glyn. By Glyn Stewart. I I haven't actually read the Warship Mage uh, series yet, but they look pretty cool for that one. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, look, Iron Brew money for Doug Clark. That is cute. Iron Brew money is always good. Keeps me an Iron Brew. I like Goss Kit Crime. I lit late for stream, but made one. We had, uh, had any call out for David Brown's Uplift Trilogies. Good science fiction fun, but also quite deep questions about genetic manipulation. I haven't featured them yet, but I might do. Don't think row wheels equal leg for this. Not at all. Someone should write a science fiction that turns the preconcepted stereotypes on the heads, like spiders equal bad and stuff. Oh. That'd be. That'd be. Yes. But. Yeah. Spiders equal to good guys. It would be quite difficult. You could do it. It would be more interesting if you had factions who were good and factions who were bad. You couldn't tell the two apart. Or all the male spiders were good and all the female spiders were trying to eat them. I know. I know. There's various things about whether or not that really happens, but it would be quite funny. We do all like Terry Pratchett. I can't read The Shepherd's Crown because I can't face the thought of there not being in any more Disco Balls. I have to admit, I have I, I stopped at um, Steam. I stopped at the uh, book with Steam in it. And Steam Trains. And haven't managed to read further. Because then there's always another Terry Pratchett for me to read. There was a child's cartoon in Hungary about a diving bell spider and other small creatures. More or less specific, uh, scientific and accurate. Did a lot to prevent arachnophobia in me. I'm glad. Ooh. Bud guy eight eight two nine. Was backup drink of Iron Brew isn't available. Um, usually Coke or Pepsi, or water or milk. Oh yes, just shush. We're going to pour this down your throat, and you'll keep chatting with us. Oh, you could pour it down your own throat. <laughs> it's all the mouth was making. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, uh, gosh, bit fun. Hemanx uh, did that a bit with the Franks being giant bugs that but end up making perfect complements to humanity. Hmm. That's good. Here's some perspective I read was where aliens perspective where every few decades show up in a cryo ship and try to kill them. Didn't know why, and they tried to find out. Hmm. Hmm. 
human shop. Hmm. So why are the humans showing up and trying to kill them? So I'm gonna. Well, I'm a bit of an amateur writer, and I'd say I have a decent knowledge of pre-steam and steel wool naval warfare. So I might give the fantasy naval combat a go, and I report back in the chat. Now I'm like, oh, that'd be cool. That'd be cool, Tom. I'm sure me and Drake would enjoy reading that. <laughs> I'm gonna Giant spider on column is also a slasher flick. Ew. True. And the main reason I'm shaking is I just, I, the nicest way, if that, that got marketed and they didn't realize it, and then my family ended up watching it, I wouldn't get any sleep for a week. If I want to scare the living daylights out of my mom and sister, or any of the women in my family, really, and I love them all, and a couple of the men, I just basically put a picture of a, um, uh, one of those Brazilian bird-eating spiders. <laughs> Amazon jungle bird-eating spiders on the screen in front of them. <sighs> so what they, uh, what a giant spider slash, slash rom-com flash effect would do for them, I don't know. <sighs> Might be funny. Just as long as I wasn't staying at home that month. <sighs> have to do it the night before I go away somewhere. <laughs> or have it go on the night after I've already gone. <sighs> Yeah. Ooh, Vision, the payback cover of The Chosen had pre journals on the cover. Cool. Then, think of Steam and Terry Pratchett made me think, uh, think, realize he was probably only a few books away from having an ironclad. I seen Vimes in charge and back to Captain. No, no, it wouldn't be Vimes in charge of the Ironclad. No, 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 no. If they were going to have a navy and put anyone in charge, it wouldn't be Vimes. Vimes would be Admiral. Or the, the Admiral in charge, it. no. It would be, um... Cheery. Corporal Cheery. Well, Sergeant Cheery, by the end of it, who'd be in charge of it. Let's be honest, if they're going to put anyone, it's going to be the Dwarf Scientist. It sounds a lot more sinister when put like that, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, Steam White. Steam White series here is good. Is there whatever help with on desk ground? Hmm. Humans is food, so what goes wrong with humans? Well, I've always been told human tastes like chicken. So I presume white meat, white wine. Although, really, you need to ask Hannibal Lecter, not me, about that one. I'm sure you're in the clear. Simsek are more worried about them being taken over by Iron Brew themselves. Because they're noticing more and more of their members are starting to drink Iron Brew. We even we even trying to get Jamie to try a, 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 a try a bottle of it. He keeps saying he's not going to, but he, he's slowly getting closer. He started on Pepsi rather than wine. Leonard the Quirm. Oh, he would have been the chief engineer. Leonard Quirm. The only example in the fantasy novel common I can think of is the Phoebus assault on the Fire Nation capital in Avatar. Hmm. <laughs> That's gone. Humans are trying to expand and colonize the planet and see the aliens as non sensitive life forms, which are problematic to the colonization efforts. In which case, if you're already doing orbit, just blast it up with, uh, you know, uh, if you have that, you, if you have the advantage that you can do cryospace and all those things, any sentient life capable of doing traveling that far in space and doing all that, he's going to have access to technologies to wipe out planets and literally level any civilization. (laughs) 
Don't hit land turn. Were there any uh Bud Gate eighty two nine, were there any other early summaries besides your turtle and Hamlet? Depends on what history you read and what you understand what you believe. But there are views which suggest that maybe the Chinese tried something and possibly um something was tried in the Greek and Roman era. But you know. The idea is trying to make something that can go underwater, or broadly speaking, underwater and human powered. Hunley and the turtle are not that advanced tech. They use a lot of steel, but mm, in nicest way, earlier times might have used brass or copper, but they still could have worked it out. That's good. I think Moist Von Liquid would end up as First Lord of the Admiralty. Possibly. Well, he'd certainly be the one sorting out the funding for it. I certainly to praise a certain biplane as well. I'm not sure, but I'm expecting there to. I, I'm presuming there's going to be a lot of the questions during the Matapan one on Friday. I'm going to have to deal with on on Blackburn Blackburns. Hello, Batman 104. Hello, X. I discovered your channel tonight. I watch your videos about the town class. One of my favorite screws in the world of war uh, war uh, warships. Glad you enjoyed it, Batman. And it's fun. It's. It, I'm glad you enjoyed the live stream. Uh, you'll notice that the live streams, there are long patrols, which are the recorded videos, if people prefer those. And then there are the lives, which Naval Street Lives, which are on Thursdays now. They used to be Tuesdays and Thursdays, now just Thursdays. And the Sunday Brewships, which are book discussion sessions, where we go through books. <laughs> Enjoy, Steam White. Take care. I thought they used iron, not steel. Well, the Romans were fairly steely. It wasn't possibly the same quality steel we use today, but it was steel. Of a kind. And that's the thing. You get and people get very hurt going, Oh, we no one produces steel like well, uh. And it's like when you're talking about the Japanese swords versus the Brit uh, versus the European swords, and people go, oh, "The Japanese sword making—they're doing all this work, and it's and that's to hammer out the impurities in the in the in the material they're using. The Europeans, who have far purer material to use, tend to don't do the, don't do the same working in the same way. They're looking for other things. There's all sort of differences in combat and the fact that in many ways the Europeans are slightly more vicious than their Japanese counterparts, uh, which sounds wrong to say, but the European, the Japanese are very vicious one-on-one -on -one in their fighting styles, especially this is what leads to certain doctrines and has this as the culture sort of grows up. Um... And there are a few Japanese commanders who are noticeably um, quite content with doing the what we we'll call the English medieval option of we're going to machine gun you, we're, we're going to do the basic version of machine gunning you with longbow arrows until none of you can stand up anymore without looking like porcupines. Or hedgehogs. Enjoy. Um, which, you know, it's fine. But that's not really as common. Whereas the uh, you know, whereas Europeans get quite enamored with the idea of mass killing their opponents quite quickly. Hmm. Vision. Robert Fulton had a sub built steam battery for USN in War of eighteen twelve. So what if British Navy ran into it? Yeah, would it catch them up? Would it work? That's the thing. If it worked, maybe. But is it a one-shot wonder? Hmm. 
Um, Calm Gaswood, if you happen to read Von Trapp's The Last Salute, how do you rate his humor? Dark, but suitably some mariner. Tom Gunning, should the episode of Gadap uh, Matapan must uh, be dedicated to our Lord and Savior, His Royal Highness Phil the Greek? Um, possibly. That's good. The story was an allegory for how humans played, pointing out that an alien race might see humans as so technology backwards as to be able to be ignored in moral decisions. Hmm. True. Vision 1840, uh, Vision, War of the Worlds, Br Aliens are British Colonizers. I'm not sure about that one, but probably. Uh, Bud Guy 829, is HS Bill Front still owned by the Royal Navy? And if not, does she only get funding from visitors? Also, how often does she get dry docked? Uh, she gets dry docked every few years. She's technically owned by the Imperial War Museum on behalf of the nation, but the Royal Navy still has an interest in her. And technically, she's maintained by volunteers, but uh, honestly, at the moment, they're starting to look into the fact that at some point, they are going to need to find a permanent dry dock for her somewhere in London and work out how they're going to do that. It's going to be interesting because there's only so long you can have her sitting in the water. Then Damascus steel map. Japanese swords in many ways a compromise between different types of iron, brittle versus many, versus European more homogenized metals. Yes, to an extent. It gets very complicated and you can go into detail. Menacing for Porcupine hedgehogs are quite dangerous. Must be arrowed. <laughs> yeah. Take care, Jespi. Enjoy dinner. Doug Lark, the corporeal representative of our holy black man, black man on earth. Oh god, that's scary. Yeah, if there is East India Company in nicest way, you are not getting away by destroying them. The East India Company do not stop coming, and when they turn up, they turn up with a lot more stuff. Imperial Britain has a habit of going, we've failed this twice. We will not repeat this a third time. We will do something different. Usually that different is, here's the entire fleet. How are you feeling? To which the locals go, hey, sugar, they brought heavy weapons. Hmm. Is there a model for sci-fi interactions with aliens and conceptions of empires at, from the more ancient world, like Rome, Par Persia, Egypt? No, that it takes. Also, bonus Bronze Age collapse? Probably. Because, honestly, space empires will be like that. And you think of how different our world is now that we have instantaneous global communication. I can email someone on the other side of the world and it will arrive in there so quick that, frankly, it might as well not be timed. Or now, I am talking to you from Surrey in the United Kingdom. There is approximately a 40 second delay, but you're watching, you can be watching this video anywhere in the world. That's amazing. But. The likelihood is once we get into space, until we ca uh, we track and we manage to manage to crack faster than light communication, which I doubt we will be able to for a while, at least a long, long while. There is going to be a delay in comms by months, years. And that's going to mean you're going to have to trust the people on the spot to be very independent. So in the nicest way, you go back to the old system of battle of running a strategic war when you might not be able to communicate with your commander in the field. 
you will literally be dependent upon messenger going backwards and forwards letter which can take weeks to get back in there by the time the letter arrives you the situation might have completely changed so you always have to factor into your plans the idea that you don't have up-to-date information they asked for 5,000 uh, 5, reinforcements. Do you send 5,000? Or has the war finished so they don't need any? Or do you presume that they might have lost more troops by the time your reinforcements arrive because there's been a time for the message to get back to you and there's going to be time to assemble troops and there's going to be time. Do you send 10,000? There is going to be a very complicated period. So... In nice way, in space empire terms, there is probably going to be a time when we can just about crawl, and then we might be able to waddle, and then maybe walk, and then maybe we've got a fast walk, and then maybe we get up to the Olympic walking speed, and then maybe a slow jog, and maybe a fast jog, and then maybe eventually we'll be running, but. We won't be sprinting for a long, long time. Damn him. Hopefully there are some there are still some docks not yet turned into trendy flats down river. Not enough, possibly. Possibly. Vision. I hope that they had there were Martians, a small Earth Island company, AG Wells. Good idea, novel from uh, Tasmanian colonization. He just got wiped out completely, so he imagined Mars doing the same to England. Hmm. Don't go on him. Empires aren't that well done in sci-fi max reference. The closest I've seen to not space Rome or base Germany is the Imperium 40k several thousand years before the main timeline. So how many relay satellites will be needed for an average Pathfinder mission when the Age of Space colonization begins? Who knows? And down here, really fast and light communication. I like the use of role succession, which is instantaneous, as a means of FTL comms and lightly torturing various mind enables. No. Anyway, I am going to say thank you to everyone because I need to go in and help pack up the house and possibly move my into my inside the house to work for this evening because I've got a bit more writing and a bit more editing to do. I hope you've had a nice evening. I hope you've had a nice time listening to me and I hope I've answered it. Questions? And I'm just going to finish the last question, but I will say thank you again to everyone who's the Super Chats. Thank you to everyone who's liked. Thank you to everyone who's subscribed. Thank you to everyone who's pressed the little bell down there. there. And thank you to everyone who's joined Discord or Patreon to fund my book habit. Thank you very much to everyone, basically. Right then. Um... I like you roll success. I don't think roll success one. Right? Come on. Re instant and delayed communications. And there is the solar system part of the expanse with hours maybe of a day, a day delay. Mm -hmm. Vision. Even FDL communication can involve delays over many light years. I'm going on that idea. Messages could um, go like wireless telegraphs in 1940s. Make to Admiralty. Mm -hmm. That's good. Or will the 5,000 troops turn up to find out the colony has been wiped out in the meantime? In which case, they better have the ability to get home if they when they arrive there, which is going to require more supplies and make even longer to get it ready. Okay, L literally watching this from the middle of the Pacific. Wonder if there will be an upper limit before a star empire is simply too big to govern. Depends what government system you set up by. Like. How loose? How tightly controlled are you trying to make it? How much power you can ask the uh, you can give to the people on the spot? You're probably going to have to set up a system which is federalized. The very center. Uh, at least the planetary level, with every planet having their own in the, having a their own sort of form of government to govern that individual planet, and then having maybe a sector level or maybe even you know higher, you're going to have to work it out. There you go. Literally, mm. Take care, John Shea. Thank you, everyone. Take care, Bitchin. Take care there, G40. Take care, Jane Peter. Take care, Nardog Wolf, Abzaski. Thank you. Dead Thank you. Dressaski. Thank you. Thank you. James Martin. Thank you. Check out Model Shipbuilding by John Airplanes. Ooh, cool. 
Tom Golding, thank you. And Eric Khan, thank you. Vision, thank you. Kings Rook, thank you. Count Dan Freeman, thank you very much for all you've done this evening, Dan, because I know you've been a minute struggling in the chat and looking after that for me. Thank you, Skippy Afghanis. Thank you, Bamo. Uh, one more four. Thank you, Jane Wolf. Thank you, Jane Peter. This didn't feel anywhere near five hours. Time work. Oh, well, she's a doctor. Mark. Thank you. Callum Gaswood. Thank you. And thank you, Bill Guy, everyone. Thank you, Seth Thompson. Thank you, everyone, basically. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Yikas. Thank you, Melanie1640. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.